Coming Home for Christmas. A Christmas on Palmer Island Romance. Written by Suzanne Ash. Chapter 1. New York City, December 10th. How much for the teacups and spoons? Claire asked. She spotted the antique china and sterling silver utensils in the shop window. They were perfect. She hoped she could afford them. A hundred dollars. The old man behind the counter looked like he didn't want to be here. Not a single Christmas decoration was up in the store, which suited her just fine. People made too big of a deal about Christmas and come the second week of December, Claire was over it. Perfect. Claire pulled out a bill. She should haggle the guy down, but she was in a generous mood. Soon she'd be Mrs. Brent Jackson, and money would no longer be an issue. Each. He made no attempt to take the bill. Two hundred dollars for everything? It was more than she'd planned to spend and would wipe out most of her cash reserves until her Christmas bonus would come in. A hundred dollars for each of the cups and saucers. Another fifty if you want the spoons to go with them. The man's voice was flat. He didn't seem to care if he made a sale today or not. How about a hundred and fifty with the spoons, she asked. The man shook his head. They finally settled on $195 for the lot. It left her with less than $200 to her name, but it would be all right. They were leaving on their trip the day after tomorrow, and she was done shopping. Claire left the shop with a smile on her face. Today was a good day. She pulled her hat farther down on her face and got ready to brave the freezing temperatures of the early evening and make her way to Brent's apartment. Babe, you're not going to believe this. I found the perfect gift for your mom. Claire walked into the Upper East Side Side condo, three times the size of the tiny Manhattan apartment she shared with her former college roommate. Their dorm had been bigger than the studio they'd shared the past two years, but they made it work. And if everything went as expected in Colorado this Christmas, she wouldn't be living there for much longer. Claire tossed her keys on the counter. Would she and Brent keep this place or look for something bigger after the wedding? Not that it mattered. What counted was that Brent was finally ready to commit. Why else would he have invited her to spend Christmas with his family in Denver? She took her hat off and shook the last few melting snowflakes from it. Brent? The lights were on, the TV was running, but there was no sign of her boyfriend. Coming. The sound came from the small bathroom off to the side. The door slid open, and Brent stepped out, doing his best to block any view of the small bathroom. He was wearing nothing but a towel. Sorry, I didn't realize, Claire turned, her cheeks growing warmer. They'd decided to wait until they got married to take their relationship to the next level, and this was by far the least dressed she'd seen him. It's okay. Why don't I throw on some clothes and we can head out for a bit? The Christmas tree at Rockefeller Plaza is supposed to be stunning. Brent walked into his bedroom, the door to his walk-in closet opening. Claire's eyes caught the pair of brown leather boots tossed into the corner of the room. They looked familiar. Then she saw the wool sweater hanging over the arm of the couch she'd spent many an evening on, snuggled up to Brent, watching a movie. It's what they'd planned to do tonight. I'm decent, Brent said. Claire turned and looked at the man she thought she'd spent the rest of her life with. Whose sweater is this? That's yours, isn't it? You must have left it the other night. Brent pulled his coat from the hook by the door and slipped into his winter boots. Stacy is in the bathroom, isn't she? Claire asked. The look on Brent's face told her everything she needed to know. How could you? It's not what you think. It didn't mean anything. Brent paced through the living room, running his hand through his hair. That's not what I asked. Is it her? Claire walked over to the couch and picked up the sweater. The scent on the garment confirmed her suspicions. She smelled this every day she walked into the office she shared with Stacy Garner. It is. We ran into each other at the bar down the street and had a few drinks. Brent stood there, his eyes moving from the bathroom door to her and back again. 
And what is she doing in your bathroom? Claire asked, her anger rising. Don't make me spell this out for you. We had a little too much to drink and with you insisting on waiting, Brent flopped down on the futon and threw his hands up. You're saying this is my fault? Claire's voice rose along with her temper. She heard bumping and splashing coming from the bathroom. All I'm saying is it doesn't help that you're a bit of a prude. Excuse me? Before Claire could launch into the rant she felt coming on, the door opened, and Stacy stepped out in a skirt and bra. I'm going to grab this and get out of here so the two of you can work this out. The woman took the sweater and pulled it over her damp hair. She sat down next to Brent, pulling her boots on. No need. I'm leaving. And Brent? She turned to face him. We're done. Is there anything else I can get you, hun? Renee, the waitress at the all-night diner, Claire had stepped into to warm up, was pouring more coffee into her cup. No, thank you. Claire wrapped her freezing fingers around it gratefully. Without her hat and gloves, it was freezing out there. She'd wandered the streets for over an hour, trying to figure out what to do. Her keys were still at Brent's, and she couldn't go back there. Facing Stacy or Brent was out of the question. She was done with both of them. Rough day? Renee asked. You could say that. I walked in on the guy I thought I was going to marry with the woman I share an office with. Somehow, saying it out loud helped. You stay right there. I'll be back. Renee walked behind the counter and returned with a slice of apple pie and a second cup of coffee. I don't. Yes, you do. The pie's on the house, and you shouldn't sit here alone, feeling sorry for yourself. Renee slid onto the bench across from her. Thank you. The simple kindness brought tears to Claire's eyes. I'm here if you want to talk about it. Or we can sit and drink coffee. Renee reached across the table and squeezed Claire's hand. I found them in his apartment. All three of us worked together. I can't go back there. Claire shook her head. The thought of ever setting foot in there or the office was out of the question. Which was a problem with her keys there and her roommate gone already for the holidays. Where are you going to go? A hotel? Renee asked, pouring three packets of sugar into her coffee and stirring it mindlessly. Claire shook her head again. A New York City hotel was out of the question. She was broke and off work until the first of the year. What about family? Is there someone you could stay with? I do. I have family down south. I could go home for a visit. Spending Christmas with her folks on Palmer Island was not what she'd planned. The town screamed holiday cheer, and her mother was one of the worst offenders with her parties. Claire was sure the house already looked like something out of a Hallmark movie. Singing Santas and twinkling lights everywhere. That sounds like a smart move. Take some time to figure out what you want to do. Renee took a sip of the coffee. I'm sure my parents would love to have me home. My mom's been trying to guilt me into coming back for a visit for months. Claire managed a small smile. Her mother would be ecstatic. How are you getting down there? Renee asked, finishing her coffee. I'm not sure. I don't have a lot of money. Flying was out of the question and renting a car wasn't an option, either. With less than $120 to her name and no car, it would be a challenge. But what else could she do? You could take the bus. It is not a fun way to travel, but sometimes a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. The bell rang, and Renee rose to take care of the two couples who walked in. Claire finished her pie, left a tip and a note for Renee, and made her way to the Greyhound bus station, three blocks down. One ticket to Myrtle Beach, she said to the man behind the counter, praying she had enough to pay for it. You're cutting it kinda close. It leaves in five minutes. Chapter 2 Our next stop is in Myrtle Beach, the older lady sitting next to Claire said. Her knitting needles were clicking. It had provided a soothing background noise for the past few hours. That's my stop. 
Claire smiled. It had been a long day. Over 18 hours on the bus had taken its toll on her backside. I'm sure you're ready to get off this bus. I have a bit longer. I'm going to Florida to visit my sister for Christmas. The woman kept knitting. I hope you have a nice time. Claire looked out the window. The sun had set, and it was hard to make out where they were. She picked up her phone. It was time to make the call she'd been putting off since she first got onto the bus late last night. Hi, Dad. I was wondering if you could come pick me up. I decided to come home for Christmas. Claire held her breath. Sure, honey. When do you get in? Her father sounded surprised and happy to hear from her. In about 30 minutes. At the Greyhound bus station downtown in Myrtle Beach. Are you serious? What are you doing on the bus? I would have sent you a plane ticket, her father said. Claire heard her mother in the background. It was a last-minute decision, and this was the easiest way to get down here. I'll explain when I get home. Can you come up here? Renting a car or calling a cab wasn't in her meager budget. Of course. I'll be there as soon as I can, her father said. She could hear him catch her mother up on the plan before the call dropped. Your parents have to be so excited to have you home, her seat neighbor said, needles clicking away. The scarf had more than doubled in size since the woman had gotten on the bus in New Jersey. I hope so. It was a last-minute thing. Claire grabbed the jacket she'd been using as a pillow and slipped into it. The bus was pulling into the brightly lit station. Merry Christmas and enjoy your time with your family. There's nothing more important. The woman smiled and stepped out to make it easier for Claire to depart. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you and your sister. Claire waved and stepped off the bus. The air was chilly after the warm bus, but nothing like the winter weather up north. She spent two dollars on a bad cup of coffee out of a machine and settled in on a bench to wait for her dad. He pulled up twenty minutes later and pulled her into a tight hug. Thanks for getting me, she said when he stepped back. Where's your luggage? Her father looked around. I only brought this. Claire held out her purse. What happened, her father asked, concern written across his face. It was a last-minute thing. I don't really want to talk about it. Can it wait until I've had a shower and about twelve hours of sleep, she asked. Of course. Let's get you home. Everyone's excited to see you. He held the passenger door open for her, and Claire got in. Who's already at the house, she asked when her father pulled on the main road. So far, just your sister and the kids. Matt is driving down for the party on Friday and will stay through Christmas. It's going to be a little tight, but we'll make do. Her father navigated through the busy streets and made his way to Highway 17, the road that led down the coast to Palmer Island and then continued on to Charleston and beyond. I forgot about the party. Claire wasn't looking forward to the big holiday shindig her mother put on every year. Close to a hundred people crammed into the house. It took a mammoth effort to pull it all together. Your mom is looking forward to an extra pair of hands. Claire's dad grinned. They'd all be working nonstop until the moment the first guests arrived. I bet she is. I should get some shut-eye while I can. Claire closed her eyes and drifted off to the soft sound of the Christmas tunes coming from the radio. Claire, can you run out and get a few strings of lights? I talked to Kenny at the hardware store, and he has them in stock. Oh, and we're out of apple juice for the kids. You don't mind, honey, do you? Her mother was dressed to the nines, a flower print apron protecting the dark gray skirt and silk blouse. The family silver was spread out in front of her on the dining room table. Sure, mom. Let me get some coffee, and I'll head out. Claire had woken up ten minutes earlier, feeling slightly human again. After a shower and dinner, she'd conked out early, spending little time with her family. I can go, Brooke said. She was sitting next to their mother, a polishing cloth in hand. Don't be silly. 
we're nowhere done with this. Claire can handle it. And turned and looked at her youngest daughter. You're not going like this, are you? Claire looked down at the baggy sweatshirt and yoga pants she'd dug out of the closet in her old room. It looked fine to her. I'll wear a coat, she said, pouring herself a cup of coffee. And do something with your hair. A little makeup couldn't hurt either. You're awfully pale. Mom. Fine. Do what you want. But don't come crying to me if you run into someone you know. And returned her attention to the large serving spoons, polishing them to a shine. Her mother's words still rang in Claire's ears when she got out of the car and walked into the hardware store. Who was she going to run into here? The dads of some of her old high school friends? Shaking her head, she set off in search of Kenny and those elusive strings of lights he'd promised to put back for her mother. Claire? Claire Hammond? The voice stopped Claire in her tracks. It couldn't be. He'd moved, before she did. She turned slowly and looked at the boy who'd broken her heart all those years ago. Aiden. How are you? I didn't know you were back in town. The last time I spoke to your mom, she said you were spending the holidays out west somewhere. The handsome man in front of her had little in common with the boy she dated in high school. His chest was broader, his chin square, and his voice deeper, with a rich undertone to it that sent shivers up her arms. His hair was longer than he'd kept it in school and darker. He looked good in his stonewashed jeans and flannel shirt. Last-minute change of plans. I didn't come in until late yesterday. Hopefully, this would explain her disheveled appearance. Man, she hated it when her mother was right. Running into Aiden would have been so much better if she was looking and feeling her best. And your mom already put you to work. Aiden grinned. She sure did. I'd love to catch up, but I'm in a bit of a rush. You haven't seen Kenny, have you? She asked. Back there. Give me a call if you can sneak away long enough to have a cup of coffee. Aiden held up a roll of weather stripping in farewell and walked out the door. Aiden Caldwell wanted to have coffee with her. Like that would make up for what he'd done. The sound of cheery Christmas tunes coming over the loudspeaker was grating on her nerves. Claire strode off in the direction Aiden had pointed to find Kenny. She needed to get out of here as quickly as possible and come up with a plan on how to avoid running into Aiden again. And how to get out of her mother's holiday party. Claire had the sinking feeling coming home to Palmer Island for Christmas had been a huge mistake. But what other choice did she have? Chapter 3 Grandma, you're supposed to let me do the heavy lifting around here. Aiden took the 20-pound sack of flour from her and set it up on the counter. Oh, please. I've been doing this my entire life. I can't wait for you any time I want to make a batch of cookies. Grandma Erin wiped her hands on the dark blue apron she wore in the bakery. That's why we set up these canisters. You're supposed to let me know when you run low. Aiden had been trying to check the white porcelain canisters with wooden lids each night before he made it up to his grandmother's apartment above the bakery, but somehow he'd missed last night. Of course, that had to be the day his grandmother ran out of all-purpose flour. You need to stop babying me, or I'm going to kick you out. I baked in this kitchen longer than both you and your father have been alive. His grandmother ripped open the brown paper sack and scooped flour into a bowl sitting on the analog kitchen scale she'd been using for as long as he could remember. Dr. Martin was very specific. You can't be lifting all this heavy stuff anymore. Your heart can't handle it right now. Getting the woman to slow down was becoming the bane of Aiden's existence. Why had he volunteered to move back to Palmer Island and take care of her again? He shook his head and took the scoop from her, filling the canister, before returning the sack of flour to the storeroom. I need brown sugar, too, his grandmother called after him. Aiden shook his head and returned with the plastic bag containing the sugar and molasses mixture that gave his grandmother's sugar cookies that little something extra. Her bakery was famous for the assortment of cookies she made this time of the year, and there'd be a line out the door as soon as they opened. 
he didn't know how Grandma Erin kept up this time of the year. Yet somehow, she did and turned a nice little profit that would carry her through to the summer when tourists created a steady boom from May through September. Don't you have work to do, she asked when he returned and grabbed a second rolling pin. The first batch of cookie dough was sitting out on the counter, ready to be rolled out and cut. Nothing pressing until later this afternoon. I thought I'd help out for a bit. And maybe talk her into sitting down for five minutes and put her feet up. They worked for two hours, the aroma of freshly baked cookies filling the store when it was time to open for the day. As expected, there was a line when he walked up to unlock the door. For once, there were a few cookies left by the time the last customer for the morning left. I think I'm going to make another batch of snickerdoodles, his grandmother said. Not until after you've taken a lunch break. It's time for your meds and some rest. Aiden locked the door and flipped the sign from open to back in an hour. It wasn't much of a break and not enough for her to take the nap the doctor had suggested, but it was what they'd compromised on. Fine. But I'm not going to rest much with you around. Why don't you go find something to do in town? Grandma Erin took two spinach and tomato tarts from the display, heated them, and handed one to Aiden. All right then. I have an errand I want to run, anyway. You better not start on those cookies until after I get back, though. He bent down and kissed her on the cheek before walking out the back and down the road. He was halfway through eating his tart by the time he got to the Christmas tree lot on the far end of Main Street. It was busy for a random Wednesday afternoon in mid-December. Thankfully, they were still well stocked, and it didn't take him long to spot a small Douglas fir that would fit perfectly in the corner of the living room. Christmas tree shopping, a familiar voice asked. Aiden turned around and looked into Claire's sparkling blue eyes. Eyes he'd dreamed about more often than he cared to admit over the years. Long after they'd both graduated and moved away from the island, she'd made appearances in his dreams. Even after he'd met Gina and eventually gotten engaged. Yes, I thought I'd surprise my grandmother. She doesn't usually take the time to decorate anything other than the bakery. He hoped by making the apartment extra cozy, he could convince her to spend a little more time resting on the couch instead of sneaking back downstairs to bake. That's a sweet idea. And the tree is beautiful. Claire walked around the small evergreen, taking it in from all angles. It was one of the better choices left, thick and full, and putting off the most amazing smell. This was what Christmas should smell like. Not the fake scent that went along with the fake trees Gina had insisted on. He wasn't going to think about her or what happened last Christmas, Aiden reminded himself for the tenth time that day. It wasn't easy when you were surrounded by holiday cheer. What are you doing here? Picking up a tree for someone special? Aiden asked. He could feel the warmth creeping up his neck. Could he be any more obvious? A wreath for my mom. She still throws those big Christmas parties and got it into her head this morning that we needed a large wreath for the front door. Claire shrugged and strolled around the small lot, eyes darting here and there. I think I saw some back over there. Aiden pointed to a wide table at the back of the lot before handing the tree he'd chosen to one of the attendants to wrap. What do you think? Claire held up a plain pine wreath that had seen better days. Aiden shook his head and dug around until he came up with something more presentable. The wreath was smaller, but the branches filled it out nicely and the color was a saturated deep green. With a bow and a few ornaments, it would look nice hanging on the large oak door to the Hammond house. That's perfect. I'll take it, she said, turning to the girl behind the table. Do you have to take this right back, or do you have time to grab a coffee? he asked. I could make time for hot chocolate. The smile on Claire's face lit up the gloomy afternoon. His stomach did some sort of flip that had nothing to do with his grandmother's tart. You can leave these here, if you'd like, the young girl said, pointing to the small tree and wreath. That'd be great. Claire nodded her thanks and put her arm into the crook of his. It was natural, familiar, like no time had passed at all. 
Arm in arm, they walked across the street to the roasted bean and ordered two hot chocolates with whipped cream. They sat at one of the outdoor tables, hands wrapped around the warm cups. How long have you been back on Palmer? Claire asked. Since late July. You just got in? Aiden took a cautious sip. The chocolate was rich, dark, and not too hot. The sugar went straight to his head. Maybe he should have stuck to the black coffee he usually ordered. I did. I thought it would be nice to spend the holidays with my folks, after all. Claire licked a bit of whipped cream off her lip, her eyes hooded. By yourself? he asked. Yes. I was seeing someone in New York, but it didn't work out. Claire looked out across the busy street. I'm sorry. Breakups suck. He leaned back, relaxing into the metal chair and watching the people rush by. Claire kept quiet. When are you going back to New York, he asked. Honestly, I'm not sure. It's, complicated. Her eyes returned to him, capturing his own gaze. He saw pain in those pretty blues of hers. When isn't it, he said, waiting to see if she wanted to elaborate. The guy I broke up with also happens to be my boss. That does complicate things. You don't think you'll be welcome at the office? Last he heard, she was in publishing or something along those lines. That's not it. I'm sure Brent would love to keep me on. I can't imagine going back though. There was more she wasn't telling him. From the sudden appearance on the island and the look on her face, he got the feeling things hadn't ended well. She'd tell him when she was ready. Or she wouldn't. At least you have some time to figure it out. He finished the hot chocolate in his cup. I do. And I better get that wreath to my mom before she sends out a search party. Claire laughed, but there was no joy in the sound. Aiden nodded. He had to get back himself and see what kind of trouble his grandmother got herself into this time. Chapter 4 Come join me, her mother called from the kitchen table when Claire walked in the next morning, still half asleep after a night spent tossing and turning and dreaming of Aidan Caldwell. What are we doing? Claire looked suspiciously at the large platter of cookies spread out in front of her mother and sister. Her niece and nephew were sitting on their chairs, hands in their laps, trying hard to be on their best behavior. Christmas songs were playing in the background. Aaron sent over a sample platter. We're choosing the assortment of cookies for the party. I think we should keep it to no more than five different varieties. And took a sip of her coffee, eyes dancing across the sweet treats in front of her. Can we try them now? Ava asked. Claire's six-year-old niece was eyeing the plate, as was Evan, her little brother. The four-year-old was reaching for one of the snowman cookies. We need a system, and said. She rose and grabbed a pen and paper from the kitchen drawer, along with a knife. She cut each of the cookies into thirds, so there'd be plenty to go around. We're going to taste them and rate them from one to five. One being the worst, five being the best. Do you understand? She looked at her grandchildren. Ava and Evan nodded. I'm not sure this is going to work, Mom. Brooke handed each of her children a cookie. Of course it will. Claire, you work with Ava. Brooke, you get Evan to come up with a judgment. Everybody, do your best. This is important. Claire bit her tongue. Only her mother could turn eating cookies into a chore. What did you think of this one, Ava? I think it's a five. Ava licked her fingers. The best Brooke could get out of Evan was that the cookie was yummy. We'll say a four for him, and said before making a note of Brooke and Claire's judgment. Here's the next cookie. Brooke handed everyone a cinnamon glazed sugar cookie. The swirly design on the top was stunning. Claire and Brooke both gave it a five. Ava was a three and Evan said it was yummy. They kept going around, tasting each of the 15 different cookie varieties Mrs. Caldwell had sent over. By the time they made it to the last one, Claire was getting sick of the cookies and the Christmas tunes. What are we doing next? Ava asked. 
I'm going to call the bakery and place the cookie order. Why don't the four of you go watch a movie? I hear the new Santa Claus one is a big hit. Claire shook her head. It was all too much. She was surrounded by holiday decorations, music, and a never-ending string of Christmas shows and movies. The Hammond family loved Christmas. As did she, once upon a time. Until her senior year in high school. It was all the reminder Claire needed that getting back with Aiden was a bad idea. She did not need a repeat of the holiday fair or the winter ball. Claire, do you have a minute? And asked after Brooke and the kids left the kitchen. Of course. What's up? Claire hopped on one of the bar stools lined up in front of the large island. Her mother was on the other side, making a list. Of cookies or something else related to the party, if Claire had to guess. I know you and Aiden haven't been close since. Never mind. You probably didn't hear, but Aaron Caldwell isn't doing so well. She has a heart condition. Aiden came back this summer to take care of her and help around the store. I know things between you two didn't end well, but be nice to him. He's got a lot on his plate right now. I wasn't planning on giving him a hard time. Or seeing him any more than absolutely necessary. Having Coco with him had been enough to show her how easy it would be to fall back into old, familiar patterns. And she knew where that led. To heartbreak and embarrassment. Good. I'm glad. I hope you don't have any plans for tomorrow. I'm taking you shopping. You need something decent to wear for the party. I can't believe you left New York with nothing but your coat and your purse. And pulled out her phone and called the bakery. Claire shook her head and walked up to her room, determined to shut out anything Christmassy for at least a little while. And then there was the issue of the party. There had to be a way to get out of attending. You have got to be kidding me. Aiden slammed his fist on the small desk in the back office of his grandmother's bakery. What's wrong, honey? His grandmother walked in, her apron dusted in flour. He heard customers chatting in the front of the store. The internet stopped working again. It was the third time this week that a Zoom call with one of his clients had dropped. At least they'd been at the end of their session. Still, it wasn't professional. And if there's one thing Aiden hated, it was looking like a fool. Or someone too cheap to get a broadband internet connection. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sure it will come right back. Why don't you help me out front for a bit? It's getting a little crowded in there. The sweet smile on his grandmother's face and the wrinkles around her dark brown eyes calmed him instantly. Sure thing. He'd spent half an hour selling cakes and cookies, and whatever else the good folks of Palmer Island wanted. And then he'd drive up to Myrtle Beach and upgrade to a faster and more stable connection. He hoped it would be something they could do on the spot. Can I get two of those snowman cookies? Aiden looked up. He hadn't noticed Claire in the throng of people that were filling the bakery. Of course. Anything else? No. I'm trying to stay away from sugar as much as I can. Claire's eyes roamed the display, belying her words. Aiden raised an eyebrow, but kept his mouth shut. His grandmother taught him early on that the customer was always right. Claire laughed. The cookies are for my niece and nephew. Sounds like you're having trouble back there. It's the internet. It keeps cutting me off. Aiden shook his head and rang up Claire's purchase. I didn't know there were any basketball games on this early in the day. Claire glanced at her watch before handing him a $5 bill. No games until Thursday. At least not any of the teams I follow. I was on a Zoom call for work. This isn't my only gig. He counted out change and handed it to her along with the small paper bag that held the cookies. Thanks. I hate it when those calls drop. I hope it wasn't an important meeting. She took the bag and stepped aside. It was, but we were mostly done. Hey, do you want to have dinner with me? We can commiserate about the downfalls of coming back home. The words were out of Aiden's mouth before he could change his mind. Her eyes grew wide. 
The question surprised her. She hesitated for a moment before answering. Sorry, I can't. I have to go. Aiden watched Claire turn and walk out the door. Chapter 5 Claire, let you and me head down to Charleston for the day. The most adorable new French boutique opened on Market Street. I'm sure we'll find the perfect little cocktail dress for you. And we can grab lunch at Magnolia's. I remember how much you loved their crab cakes. And was waiting in the kitchen, a cup of coffee in hand, when Claire came down Saturday morning. Sorry, Mom. I can't make it. I promised Brooke to take Ava and Evan to the holiday fair today. She's having lunch with Matt. Her sister and her brother-in-law were also doing a little last-minute Christmas shopping for their kids, but Claire knew better than to say that out loud. Her niece and nephew had supersonic hearing when there was something they weren't supposed to hear. But what about the party? You can't show up in a pair of jeans and that oversized sweater you've been wearing every day. And shook her head. I've loved that sweater since high school. It's comfortable. But don't worry. I'll borrow something appropriate from Brooke, Claire said. She was still hoping to find a way to bow out gracefully. Being stuck in a room with a bunch of local busybodies who wanted to know why she was here without the boyfriend wasn't how she wanted to spend her time. I don't know, her mother raised her eyebrows and looked Claire up and down. We're almost the same size. It'll work. Stop worrying about it. If all else fails, I'll hide out in my room. Or left for the evening. The only problem with that was that everyone she knew well was going to be at the party. Aunt Claire, are you ready to go? Ava ran up, wearing her boots and dragging her coat behind her. Not quite. Why don't you go watch some cartoons or something and let me get woken up? The fair won't open until noon anyway. Claire grinned. Her niece's enthusiasm was infectious. Are you sure you're going to be able to handle both of them at the fair? Her mother asked. Of course. We'll have a blast. And don't worry. I'm not going to lose one of them. Worst case scenario, they'll have way too much sugar. Claire poured herself a large cup of coffee and hopped on one of the bar stools. I wouldn't leave them with Claire if I didn't trust her. Brooke walked up and put her arm around Claire's shoulder. Don't lose my kids, she whispered in her ear. Don't come running to me if something happens. I'll head to the spa then if we're not going to Charleston. And strode out of the room, looking and sounding a little peeved. What did you do? Brooke asked. Declined a shopping trip to Charleston. Claire finished her coffee, the sweet caffeine coursing through her veins. She was ready for a fun day at the Palmer Island Holiday Fair. The moment she pulled up, she knew this had been a mistake. How could she have forgotten about the music? The place was decked out in Christmas cheer and a local musician was singing his heart out on the small stage in the center of the fair. Can we go ice skating now, Aunt Claire? You promised. Anna was bouncing in her seat and Evan was doing everything he could to unbuckle. Of course. It's the first thing we'll do. Wearing these two out before they explored the rest of the fair seemed like a smart idea. Claire congratulated herself on her babysitting skills. Oh, Ava's shoulders slumped, her tone dire when they walked up to the fenced-in area of the ice rink. It was a glorified piece of plastic in the shape of an oval. Kids strapped plastic skates on their shoes with felt on the bottom that sort of slid across the plastic ice. This looks like fun. And it won't be as cold as real ice. Especially if you fall. Claire did her best to sound upbeat. They got in line to get tickets for the ice rink. No adults on the ice, the attendant warned when it was their turn. Two tickets please. Claire turned to her niece and nephew. You're going to have so much fun. It's just like that video I sent you a few weeks ago from New York. She and Brent had gone up to Rockefeller Center and skated. She'd made Brent film a little clip to send to the kids. This is not that cool. Ava pouted but sat down on the little bench to strap on her skates. Go give it a try. The other kids are having fun. 
and stay with your brother. Claire helped Evan and got him out on the plastic ice. Claire? I heard you were back in town. How is the Big Apple treating you? Mrs. Caldwell waved and stepped closer, pulling Claire into a tight hug when she walked out of the ice rink enclosure. New York and I are ready for a bit of a break. That's why I'm down here. Claire turned to watch Ava and Evan. Ava was getting the hang of it, her eyes sparkling with joy. Evan kept falling on his bottom, but with a determined look on his face, he got up each time to try again. Brooks kids? Mrs. Caldwell asked. Claire nodded. They are getting so big. Mrs. Caldwell shook her head and sat down on one of the benches surrounding the rink. She looked pale and a little out of breath. Grandma, I told you to wait for me. Aiden jogged up, holding a small paper bag. I saw Claire across the way and thought I'd say hello. Did you get the mistletoe? Aiden held up the bag. Claire, come sit and tell me how you've been, Mrs. Caldwell said, patting the seat beside her. I should go help Evan. Claire wasn't sure what she could do, but the little boy was getting more and more frustrated. I've got this. Aiden handed the bag to his grandmother and, putting one hand on the plastic barrier surrounding the rink, hopped over it like it was nothing. Claire swallowed hard as she watched him walk across to the attendant. A minute later, he came back with a gnome with handles. He pulled Aiden up and showed him how to use the gnome. It worked a little like a walker. It was training wheels for ice skating, and just what the little boy needed. He's always been good with kids. Mrs. Caldwell patted Claire on the knee. Aiden's good at a lot of things. The words flew out of Claire's mouth before she could take them back. Thinking about how good he had been at kissing, Claire blushed. She was talking to the man's grandmother. I never understood why the two of you broke up, Aaron Caldwell said when Aiden came back, walking through the small gate instead of vaulting over the barrier again. That was a long time ago. We were kids. Claire kept her eyes trained on Ava and Evan as they scooted across the rink, both of them laughing and having fun. I still say you made a mistake letting this one go, Aiden. Mrs. Caldwell smiled, small lines forming around her eyes. Maybe I did. But at the time, Aiden shrugged. What happened at the time? Mrs. Caldwell asked, and Claire had to force herself not to stare at him. She'd wondered why he'd blown her off at the winter ball. A week later, they'd officially broken up. The night before her parents' big Christmas party. This is embarrassing, especially looking back. Aiden moved around in his seat, his eyes still on the kids. Don't start. Spit it out, or I'll share some of those embarrassing stories from when you were a toddler. His grandmother's tone was light. She was teasing Aiden. Don't you dare, he said, a big grin on his face. Claire was dying to know what kind of dirt this woman had on the former captain of the Palmer High basketball team. Up to you. Why did you and Claire break up? Mrs. Caldwell asked. Aiden turned to look and looked right at Claire. Dad thought spending so much time with you was a distraction. He had high hopes I'd make it into the pros or at least get a full-ride scholarship somewhere. Claire's heart came to a shuddering stop. All these years she'd wondered what she had done, where she'd gone wrong. She was speechless. Well if that isn't the biggest piece of nonsense. Wait until I speak to your father. Mrs. Caldwell rose and handed the bag back to Aiden. Calm down, Grandma. This isn't good for your heart. It was a long time ago. Who knows what would have happened between Claire and me. Aiden's eyes darted from his grandmother to her and back to the older woman who started stalking off in the direction of the parking lot. Go, she said, watching him stride off to catch up with his grandmother. Aunt Claire, can we go get some hot chocolate and then come back to skate some more? Ava asked a few minutes later. Hot chocolate sounds like a great idea. She could use something comforting and plenty of sugar to buffer the shock of what she'd found out this afternoon. With whipped cream and marshmallows? Ava asked excitedly, already busy taking her skates off. Of course. Claire looked up to see if Evan needed help. 
His gnome was not far from Ava, but her nephew was nowhere to be found. Chapter 6 Evan Claire was dragging Ava behind her, scouring the holiday fair for any sight of the little boy in his light blue jacket. How did he get out of the skating rink enclosure, and where was he? Claire's heart was beating a million miles a minute. She refused to let her mind go to the darkest what-if scenarios. This was sleepy little Palmer Island, not New York City. But with each second that passed, it became harder to keep those dark thoughts at bay. Aunt Claire, not so fast. Ava was struggling to keep up. Claire forced herself to slow down when all she wanted to do was race around the fair, tearing down displays until she found Evan. Claire, what's wrong? Mrs. Caldwell put a hand on her arm. Claire almost jerked back, surprised by the woman's appearance, by her side. Evan is missing. I only looked away for a moment when we said our goodbyes. Claire's words were breaking, tears pooling in the corners of her eyes. She wiped at them angrily. This wasn't the time to fall apart. Evan needed her. Ava needed her. She had to think clearly. Every moment counted when a child was abducted or missing. Every cop drama on TV she watched said so. Aiden, you go look for little Evan with Claire. Ava and I will wait right here and keep an eye out as well. Go. Mrs. Caldwell pushed her grandson out toward the center of the fair before taking Ava's hand and walking to a nearby picnic table. Claire hadn't even noticed him. Do you have a picture of Evan? Aiden asked. Claire nodded. Text it to me, he said, taking her phone and pushing his number in. She did as asked, too numb to question anything. I'm going to go look for him. Hold on a second. We need a plan. Let's start with this row here. I'll take the right. You take the left. We'll meet up at the big Christmas tree in the center. Okay. Claire ran to the first stand, showing the woman selling handmade ornaments, the picture of Evan. I don't think I've seen him, but I'll keep an eye out for the little fellow. The woman smiled at her encouragingly. Claire bit out a thanks and quickly made her way to the next stall, pushing through a group of people who complained until they heard what was going on. On and on she went, from one booth to the next, shoving her phone in the face of anyone who would give her the time of day. When she made it to the tree and saw Aiden's face, the panic inside grew. They had to find him. They had to. The ocean was just a few hundred yards away. No luck? Aiden asked. Claire shook her head. I should call my sister and tell her what's going on. We still have a lot of ground we can cover, he said. She nodded, and Aiden took off to work his way along another row of stalls. Claire opened the address book on her phone and made the call to Brooke. Hey, are you guys having fun at the fair? Her sister asked the moment she answered. We were. Listen, Evan got away from me. I'm not sure where he is, but I'm looking for him. Aiden and a few others are helping. I'm sure we'll find him in no time, but thought you should know. Evan is lost? How did that happen? Her sister kept talking. Claire half listened and kept walking around the fair, keeping her eyes peeled for her nephew. Matt was talking as well. We're doing everything we can, but you should probably head back home, just in case. Claire peeked behind the candied apple booth to see if he'd hidden among the crates stacked behind the small building on wheels. We're almost on the island. I'll call you when we get to the fair. Did you alert the police? Brooke asked. No, not yet. Claire hung on to the hope that she'd see him walk out of the crowd or that someone recognized him and helped him find her or her family. Okay, we'll call. They might get in touch with you before we get there. Claire, please find my baby boy. The break in Brooke's voice almost did Claire in. I will, she said and hung up. Claire looked around for Aiden, hoping beyond hope that he'd found Evan. She didn't see him or her nephew in the thick throng of people. People she knew. People she'd grown up with. Claire talked to everyone she recognized, asking them to help look for Evan. 
she shared his picture again and again. Within a few minutes, dozens of residents were out there looking, the picture of the four-year-old up on their own phones. Brooke and Matt arrived at the same time the sheriff did. Did you find him? Her sister called from halfway across the small field that the fair was held in. Not yet. We have a bunch of people looking. Claire explained what they'd done and how much ground they'd covered so far. Aiden joined them, shaking his head when Claire caught his eye. You did good work. We'll expand the search parameters, and I'll get every one of my deputies out to comb the island. Don't worry, ma'am. We'll find him. The sheriff sounded more confident than Claire felt. It was hard not to lose hope with the fading light. Aiden hated seeing Claire like this. Helpless and in a lot of pain. He'd made his way up and down every single row of the market and fair. He talked to every single vendor and most of the visitors. At least it felt that way. Still, they'd had no luck locating Evan. There had to be something else he could do. Anything to wipe that worried look not only off Claire's face, but Brooke's as well. He'd grown up with the Hammond girls. They'd been friends long before he and Claire started dating. And while he didn't know Matt well, he felt for the man standing there, looking as helpless as Aiden felt. What do you want us to do? Matt asked the sheriff. Honestly, the best thing you could do is head home and wait for a phone call, the sheriff said. From us. Or any one of your friends and neighbors who may have picked him up. Does he know the address to your mom's house? Brooke shook her head. He knows his first and last name and the street we live on in Marion, but not down here. We're only down for Christmas break. Phone number? the sheriff asked, taking notes. I do. Ava rattled off a ten-digit number, which Aiden assumed was her mother's cell. That's excellent. Do you know what to do if you ever get lost? the sheriff asked the little girl. Find a police officer or another mommy and ask them for help. And don't talk to any strangers. Evan knows that part too. The expression on Ava's face was dead serious. Aiden wondered if the bit about not talking to strangers was hurting them in this instance. It didn't sound like Evan knew anyone outside his family here on Palmer Island. I'll get this picture out to all my guys right away. If you don't want to go home, keep your own phones close. Is anyone at the house? The sheriff typed away on his phone. Our parents, Claire said. She was pale and shaking, despite the relatively mild temperatures. Aiden took off his Columbia jacket and draped it around her shoulders. It wasn't much, but it was something. You don't happen to be looking for this young man, a voice called across the open space in front of him. All eyes turned in the direction it had come from. Miss Doris, one of the most prominent members of the Palmer Island community and the only baker that gave his grandmother a run for her money, walked up with Evan. Evan, where have you been? I'm so glad you're okay. Brooke ran up to hug her son, her husband less than a step behind her. Where did you find him, Doris? Aiden's grandmother asked. He didn't notice her walking up, but Ava was standing by her mother's side. Brooke was holding Evan. Matt had his arm around both of them and a hand on Ava's shoulder. He didn't blame the man. He was hiding under the bake sale table, sneaking cookies. I can't believe he stayed so quiet the entire time. If I hadn't seen his little hand reach up for another thumbprint cookie, the older woman shook her gray curls. All's well that ends well. Good work, Miss Doris. I'm going to head out and call off the search. Merry Christmas, everyone. The sheriff tipped his hat and strode off, away from the crowd and back to his vehicle. I should head back to our booth. It's getting a little crazy tonight. Everyone's in the mood for cookies, Miss Doris said. Could you use an extra pair of hands? Aiden's grandmother asked, and Miss Doris gladly accepted. He watched the two of them walk off arm in arm, heads together. He didn't want to know what they were gossiping about this time. We're going to take these guys home. Thanks for your help, Aiden. Brooke waved at him and walked off with Matt and the kids. I should head back too, Claire said. 
She shrugged out of his jacket and tried to hand it back to him. Not a chance. We're going to get you warmed up and some food in you. Mary's diner? He put the jacket back around her shoulders and gently steered her in the direction of his car. I should go back and talk to Brooke. She's upset with me. She couldn't even look at me. Claire was shaking like a leaf. The shock of everything that had happened today was settling in, and he had to act quickly. Give her a little time. This wasn't your fault, and she'll see that once she has Evan home and tucked into bed. You're shaking. You need to eat and process this. Mary's diner. Dinner's on me. Do you still like that peanut butter pie? This time, he didn't wait for an answer. He put his hand on the small of her back and walked her to his truck. Chapter 7 When was the last time Claire had been to Mary's diner? The place had changed little since her high school cheerleading days. The familiarity and warmth of the place made her feel a little better. That and the text from Brooke to let her know they made it to the house okay. What can I get you? A woman in her mid to late thirties walked up to the booth Aiden had chosen for them. Her name was Sandy, and Claire didn't remember seeing her here back in the day. Do you have a soup special tonight? Aiden asked. We sure do. Homemade corn chowder. It's fantastic. Sandy pulled a small notepad from her apron. Two bowls of chowder and two grilled cheese. If that sounds good to you, Claire. Aiden looked from Sandy to her. Claire nodded her approval. She forced herself to smile at Sandy. Two corn chowders and two grilled cheese. What can I get you two to drink? Sandy asked. Two sweet teas and some water would be great, Aiden said. Claire was too tired to protest his choice. I don't drink sweet tea, she said after Sandy left. You do tonight. The sugar will help with the shock. He reached across the table and took her hands in his. They were large and warm. She felt the heat transferring into her fingers and up her arms. It felt like she was thawing out. Claire suppressed a yawn, surprised at how exhausted she felt now that her heart stopped racing. Thank you for your help tonight. I don't know what I would have done if you and your grandmother didn't show up. Evan may not have sneaked off in the first place if I didn't distract you. Aiden's voice was low, his eyes no longer on her, but their hands. Claire pulled hers out from his. Aiden, this wasn't your fault. He was my responsibility. I should have paid more attention. You did. I watched you. Even when we were talking, you're always checking on the kids. Maybe there's nothing either of us could have done to prevent this. Aiden sighed. Maybe you're right. The important thing is that he's safe. But I'm pretty sure Brooke won't let me babysit her kids again. Claire didn't have to force a smile this time. That might not be a bad thing. Since she's raising a little escape artist. Aiden grinned. Claire burst out laughing. Maybe you're right. They can be a handful sometimes. By the time Sandy returned with the drinks, Claire was feeling more like herself. She took a long sip of the sweet tea, feeling the cool liquid rush through her system. Better? Aiden asked, his eyes cautiously hooded, a small smile, playing around his lips. I am. How did you know? About the sugar helping? she asked. It's kind of my job to know these things. Claire raised an eyebrow. I'm a sports nutritionist. I study how food and things like Mary's famous sweet tea affect the body. That sounds interesting. And you help people get over shocks. Or lose weight, or what? Claire was rambling and had to force herself to stop talking. I help athletes boost their performance by making tweaks to what they eat and when they eat. But it comes in handy when your former girlfriend has a rough day. He winked. Rough day is an understatement. That's right up there with last week when I walked in on Brent in the shower with another woman. Claire's hand flew to her mouth. She did not mean to share that personal detail of the garbage fire that was her life right now. Ouch. 
and here I felt bad for getting dumped on Christmas Eve. The smile was gone from Aiden's face. The woman you were engaged to? Claire asked. Her mother had mentioned Aiden moving back after a broken engagement. She'd assumed he'd broken things off to come care for his grandmother. One and the same. I thought all was well. Then, out of the blue, she walked out on Christmas Eve. A couple of hours before we were supposed to go to her grandmother's house. Aiden shook his head. There was pain in his eyes. Claire reached over and gave his hand a quick squeeze. I'm sorry. That had to be rough. We don't have too much luck with this whole Christmas thing, do we? He asked, a wry smile on his face. We don't. At least not when it comes to relationships. Or escape artist nephews. Maybe we should give up on it altogether. Claire grinned. The idea had merit. She wouldn't have to attend holiday parties, including the one her mother was throwing in two days. No more Christmas music, no holiday movies. It was starting to sound better and better. Really, what was it with all this commercialized Christmas stuff? The only good things were the candles and cookies. Sounds like a plan to me. No more Christmas stuff for either of us. Sandy walked up to their table and delivered the soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. This was a good idea, Claire said. The soup was warming her up from the inside, and the food settling in her stomach soothed her mind and emotions as well. Remember, that's why they pay me the big bucks. Aiden took a big bite out of his grilled cheese. I didn't think there was a big market for a sports nutritionist on Palmer Island. Claire dipped her spoon back into the rich chowder. There isn't. I work out of Atlanta. A lot of my clients are pro athletes, Aiden said. You're able to work remotely? For now. My boss gave me some leeway this summer when my grandmother needed help. Her patience is starting to wear thin, though. Zoom isn't quite the same as in-person meetings. Aiden's eyebrows were knitted together, his jaw looking tight. And the internet issues aren't helping, are they? Did you get that fixed? she asked. They did what they could, but unless we switch to fiber, there's only so much they can do with the old cable lines. Until I make the move permanent, that's not worth the time and money it takes to get it installed. And I don't know how much longer my boss is going to let me get away with spending most of my time up here. Is she getting better? She seemed in pretty good shape earlier tonight, Claire said. Some days are better than others. The problem is that she tries to do too much when I'm not around. I try to go down to Atlanta when I can, but it's not a good long-term solution. I assumed you were self-employed, Claire said. Between the Zoom calls and clients he'd mentioned, it hadn't been a hard conclusion to jump to. I wish. No, I work for a sports medicine clinic. There are a few independent sports nutritionists, but the majority of us work either for medical centers or sports franchises. How about you? How's the publishing going? Aside from the fact that I broke up with my boss? Claire took a bite of her sandwich to buy herself some time. That's going to make it awkward going back to the office after New Year's, isn't it? Yeah. Especially since the person I caught him with works at the office as well. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Part of me wants to quit, but that's not really an option. Not too many independent book publishers out there. The thought of what to do had been niggling in the back of her mind since she'd gotten down here. What happened to the writing you were doing in high school? I figured you went into publishing to get your own books out there. Aiden scraped the last of his soup out of the bowl. I haven't had much time to look at it, let alone polish something enough to get an editor to even look at it. If anything, working in traditional publishing has taught me how next to impossible it is to get a contract. I can't tell you how many rejection letters I send out every month. That sounds depressing, Aiden said. It is. What about you? Any ideas for making things work? I assume your grandmother will need the extra help for a while. Claire finished the last of her tea and sat back, pleasantly full and feeling calmer, despite the conversation. Not really. 
I'm playing it week by week for now. Sandy walked up to their table, to clear their plates and bowls. Can I interest you two in dessert? she asked. Aiden looked at Claire. She shook her head. I don't think I have room for dessert. It was a shame. Mary's pies were legendary. Claire wondered if her mother had ordered some for the party. That might sweeten the deal if she ended up having to make an appearance. Three slices of Mary's peanut butter pie to go, please. In individual containers, if you don't mind. Aiden turned up the charm, smiling big at the poor waitress. Claire swore it looked like Sandy was blushing as she rushed into the back to grab their desserts. You are such a flirt, Claire said after Sandy left. I don't know about that. My charm seems entirely lost on you these days. He winked, a small smile, playing around his lips. That's because I grew immune a long time ago. It was a lie, but with both of their futures up in the air, this was not the time or place to rekindle an old relationship. Chapter 8 Hey, Mom. What's up? Aiden asked when he picked up the phone. He was plating the scrambled eggs he made for breakfast. I wanted to check in with you, see how you're doing. This time of the year probably isn't easy for you since. Not since Gina dumped me on Christmas Eve. It's okay to talk about it. In a way, it helped. I still don't understand why she'd do that. Not just the timing. I'm sure she's regretting her decision. Not that I think you should take her back. His mother coughed. You're not getting sick, are you? He asked. No. I'm having a cookie. Nothing like the ones your grandmother makes. Something from one of the gift baskets they send your father. You should see the dining room table. His mother laughed. Watch your sugar intake. It's not good for your immune system, especially if you guys are traveling on a plane this time of year. Aiden stuck a couple of slices of whole wheat bread into the toaster. I will. I've been taking those supplements you suggested too. They've been helping. My mood is much better than it usually is this time of the year. Good. Get outside when you get a chance too. Sunshine is important. His mother had suffered from seasonal disorder for years. He was glad that she was improving. I will. I am. Stop changing the subject. Are you seeing anyone? I'm not the one who changed the subject. You did. And no, I'm not seeing anyone. Between helping at the bakery and work, there isn't much time for anything else. Maybe Gina was right. I didn't have a lot of time for her. Oh, please. You made plenty of time for her. We barely saw you when the two of you were together. And there is nothing wrong with loving your work and wanting to do a good job. You make a difference in your clients' lives. How many of those young people made it to the pros because of your advice? And what about that young man you told me about who recovered from surgery in record time because you worked with him? What you do is important. Thanks, Mom. It didn't always feel that way, especially on days like today when his clients were complaining about the restrictive diet he'd put them on. Or when they simply ignored his advice and then were surprised when they didn't get the results they expected. Don't let the memories get you down. It wasn't your fault it didn't work out with Gina. Some things aren't meant to be, and it's better you found it out now than down the road when there are kids involved. That's true, but I wasn't completely innocent. Gina had a point. I've been working a lot and didn't make enough time for her. It had taken him a long time to realize that, but he was man enough to admit that he didn't always make her his number one priority. Aiden, a relationship is give and take and building a life together. It isn't making your life revolve around that one person. Yes, you were busy, but you made time for her when you could. Don't you dare think this was all on you. I won't, and I'm okay, really. I even got a little Christmas tree for Grandma Erin. I'm not saying I'm back into the Christmas spirit, but I'm getting there. And a certain blonde ex-girlfriend of his was a big reason for that. I'm glad. And that's nice. 
your grandmother always had the most beautiful antique ornaments. She still does. The tree is full of them. You're going to love it. Aiden smiled. It would be nice to have everyone together for Christmas. It had been years since they'd all made it back to Palmer Island for the holidays. About that, his mother said. Don't tell me. Dad has a last-minute business trip. Ever since his father had taken a position with a large poultry company and moved to Arkansas, he'd spent more time on the road than at home. He does. He has to go up to Montreal to meet with clients, and I decided to join him. The city is supposed to be beautiful this time of year. We're going to stay over Christmas, but we'll come see you guys on the way back. We can all spend New Year's together. His mother's tone was apologetic, but he could tell she was excited. That sounds like a fun trip. Is Dad calling Grandma? he asked. He was hoping you'd break the news to her. You've always been good at talking to her. The two of you have always been close, his mother went quiet. Aiden wasn't surprised. His father hated conflict, and he and Aiden's grandmother didn't have the easiest relationship. He'd resented working in the bakery and being made the man of the house at a young age. Aiden, on the other hand, had loved helping out in the shop. He still did. There was something soothing about making a loaf of hearty sourdough bread or watching the joy on a child's face when they picked out a cookie or cupcake. You don't mind, do you? his mother asked, her voice less sure of herself. Aiden sighed. I'll take care of it. Go have fun in Montreal and send me some pictures. I'll do better than that. I'll send both of you something fun from their Christmas market. I pulled a couple of outfits from my closet that I think might work. And walked into Claire's room with an armful of outfits, most of them sheath dresses. Claire closed her laptop and rose. I told you, I'll borrow something from Brooke. She hadn't had a chance to talk to her sister yet, but she was sure there was something she could wear that didn't scream middle age. Your sister traveled very light this year. I doubt you'll find much to choose from. This here is my favorite. I think the color will be perfect for you. Why don't you go try it on? And held a burgundy dress with dark gray accents out to her. It was beautiful, but too form-fitting for Claire's taste. Mom, I don't think. Just try it on. I'll wait. Her mother handed her the dress and pushed her in the direction of the bathroom. With little choice, Claire did as her mother asked, walking out a minute later in the uncomfortably tight dress. I don't think this will work. Maybe with the right shapewear and if you could lose a few pounds before the party, her mother walked around Claire, her eyes moving up and down. That's not going to happen, Mom. Claire wasn't about to give up on cookies. The sweets were the only thing she still liked about Christmas. All right. Then try this one. It has a little more give, and it'll pick up the color of your eyes. The dress her mother handed her was midnight blue with a bit of sparkle. Claire had never seen this one. She took an instant liking to it. Unzip me, please? There you go. Her mother sat down on the bed, putting the other two gowns beside her. She looked tired. I'll be right back. Claire quickly changed into the blue dress. It fit like a glove, and the material was divine. Soft and velvety. Claire felt pretty. It was the only way to describe it. That's the one. It looks better on you than it ever did on me, her mother said when Claire stepped back into the bedroom. It is stunning. Where did this come from? I don't think I've seen it. The dress had a vintage feel to it, and while it didn't smell musky, Claire didn't think it was a recent addition to her mother's closet. Don't laugh. It was what I wore for the winter formal, the year I graduated college. It's been hanging in the back of my closet ever since. I forgot how timeless it was. It is beautiful. But about the party, Claire took a breath. I know you're hesitant about going, but I don't understand why. You know everyone who will be here. And they'd love to see you again. Everyone's been asking about you. That's the problem. 
Claire sat next to her mother on the bed. How so? Her mother asked, her voice gentle, eyes on Claire. For the first time since she'd come home, her mother seemed like she genuinely wanted to know and was ready to listen. It's because I broke up with Brent. I know people have been wondering when I'd get married. They'll ask about what happened, why I didn't go to Colorado, as planned. And even if they don't know about the breakup yet, they'll wonder where he is. I'm not sure I'm ready to have those conversations. Claire wasn't sure she ever would be. Finding your boyfriend with another woman was not just painful. It was embarrassing. Especially when said woman insinuated that you didn't take care of your man. What was wrong with being a little old-fashioned? That's what this is about. Honey, you have nothing to worry about. Everyone that will be here loves you. They won't give you a hard time about Brent. I bet you no one will even bring it up other than to offer their support. And you better hope Brent doesn't show up around here. Us Southerners may be a welcoming bunch, but if you're hurting one of our own, you better watch out. Her mother's laughter made Claire feel better, as did the quick hug the woman pulled her into. Even so, I'm not sure I'm ready for an event. Claire looked down at the dress. It would be a shame to miss an opportunity to wear it. You'll be fine. I'm going to need your help and support. This party isn't a piece of cake, despite how I make it look, and said. I don't think I have any shoes to go with this. I can't very well go barefoot, and I don't think my boots or sneakers will work. Claire threw one last argument out there, knowing it was a lost cause. We'll go shoe shopping first thing tomorrow morning. I feel sure we can find something. All you need are some simple pumps. They'll mostly be hidden by the skirt anyway. The dress skimmed the floor. With heels, it would be the perfect length for Claire, which surprised her. Her mother was a few inches taller. On her, the dress must have been above the ankles. And if we can't find anything, you won't give me a hard time for hiding out in my room? Claire asked. Not a chance, her mother said, picking up the other dresses and leaving the room. Chapter 9 Grandma, do you have a minute? We need to talk. Aiden walked into the bakery where his grandmother was busy working on today's batch of quick breads. He could smell the sourdough loaves baking in the oven. If it's that internet stuff again, I don't want to hear about it. It works fine for what I need it for. If you need something faster, set it up, but stop bothering me about it. I don't have time for that. Especially not this time of the year. The next few weeks will see us through until the tourists come back this summer. It's not that. I have it handled. I talked to mom, Aiden didn't know how to break the news to his grandmother. Did something happen to Harry? She spun around and wiped her hands on her apron. No, no. He's fine. Everyone's okay. There's been a slight change in plans for Christmas, though. Aiden leaned against the counter, observing his grandmother. Business trip? she asked. To Montreal. How did you know? His grandmother turned to get back to weighing the flour. Your dad mentioned there was a chance he'd have to go up there right before Christmas. You're not surprised or disappointed? Aiden asked. I'm sure they'll stop by on their way back home. We can celebrate Christmas with them then. If you think about it, it's just a date on the calendar. What counts is spending time with your loved ones. And I'm lucky. I have you all of December. She reached up and patted his cheek. You're taking this better than I expected. And maybe you have a point. It's about the sentiment, not any particular day. Aiden strode over and started greasing the stack of loaf pans sitting on the counter. I've been around the block a time or two and learned some things along the way. The most important one of those is to not let petty stuff steal your joy. Is your mom going with him? Aiden nodded. She sounded excited about Montreal. Good. He won't be alone, and I'm sure it's beautiful up there this time of year. I saw a travel show about it a few years ago. It looked so picturesque with the snow and those European-style markets. 
They'll have a good time, and we'll do something special as soon as the shop closes at noon on Christmas Eve. But first, we have to get these loaves in the oven and make another batch of snowman cookies. I don't know why they're so popular this year. She shook her head and stirred jalapenos and sharp cheddar cheese into the first batch of batter. I think Claire's niece and nephew have been spreading the word around the younger population of Palmer Island. Aiden grinned, thinking about Claire coming in several times this week to buy the simply decorated sugar cookies. They worked in companionable silence for a little while, Christmas music playing in the background. Customers dropped in and out, but it never got too busy. It was a nice change of pace from the mad rush on Saturday morning. This is the last of them. Apple bread and a new spiced peach loaf I'm trying out. Would you pop these in the oven for me while I get the sugar cookie dough from the fridge? His grandmother asked. Of course. Do you think the last batch is ready? He asked. His grandmother spun around, slipping on a bit of flour he'd spilled and meant to sweep up. Aiden jumped toward his grandmother, but she was on the ground before he reached her. Are you hurt? I'm fine. I think. Her face was pale, her eyes wide, pupils fully dilated. Can you stand up? He held out both of his hands and pulled her off the floor. The moment his grandmother tried to put weight on her right foot, it gave out from under her. He caught her just in time, pulling her into a close hug. Maybe not as fine as I thought. It's my ankle. She huffed, sounding more annoyed than in pain. Aiden hoped that was a good sign. Let's get you into that chair over there. Ever since the doctor had ordered more rest, he'd been trying to convince her to spend at least some of her busy day sitting behind the counter. Usually to no avail, but this time, his grandmother complied. She hopped, supported by him, to the chair and sat down. I'm sure it will be fine in a minute. I must have twisted it when I went down. I'm glad we didn't have any customers in the store. She shook her head before bending over to rake the flower off her dark pants. I think we should have someone check you out. You could have broken your hip. Or a collarbone. He looked at his grandmother closely. The color was returning to her cheeks, and she didn't seem in a lot of pain. I'm pretty sure I'd know if either of those had happened. Do you remember how much pain you were in when you broke your collarbone in high school? The whole stadium heard that scream. She smiled, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. You have a point there. Tell you what. Elevate your leg, and let's put some ice on it and see how it looks in half an hour. If it's not any better, I'm taking you to see Dr. Martin. Not until those breads are done and the snowman cookies are baked, his grandmother said. We have frozen peas in the kitchen upstairs. I promise to put them on as soon as that's done. Aiden shook his head but jogged upstairs. By the time he returned, his grandmother was standing up at the counter, ringing up a customer. I should have closed the store, he mumbled under his breath. What's that? his grandmother asked. You heard the man. Stay off your feet and keep the ankle elevated, Aiden said as they walked out of Dr. Martin's practice. And you heard him. It's only sprained. There is no need to make a big deal about this. His grandmother hobbled out onto the sidewalk, barely supported by his arm. Miss Aaron, what happened? Are you okay? Claire stepped out of the shoe store next to where Aiden's truck was parked. Her mother followed close behind, carrying two large shopping bags. I'm fine, dear. I twisted my ankle. Aiden here is making a bigger deal about it than it needs to be. I'm sure Dr. Martin has better things to do than to tend to my old legs. His grandmother laughed and hobbled over to give Claire a hug. How is she? Claire asked, looking at Aiden. He noticed he had her mother's attention as well. She's fine. It's a sprained ankle, but Dr. Martin said he's glad you came in, Grandma. He turned to Claire. It'll be fine as long as she stays off it. We'll do a follow-up visit in five days. I hate to ask, Anne's eyes darted from his grandmother to him and back to her. We will get your cookies done in time, don't you worry. 
Worst comes to worst, I'll send Aiden over to deliver them. I promised you six dozen, and that's exactly what you'll get. Grandma Aaron patted Claire's mother's arm before turning to continue her walk to his truck. Aaron? What happened? An old white Oldsmobile came to a stop in the middle of the main street. Miss Doris rolled down her window, sticking her head out for a better look. I'm fine. I slipped and twisted my ankle. His grandmother's voice was impatient, tired of repeating the same story again and again. Hold up. With the speed of a Hollywood stunt driver, Miss Doris pulled into the parking spot less than 20 yards ahead of them. She was out of her vehicle just as quickly. Here we go, Grandma Erin shook her head. What did you do this time? Miss Doris asked when she caught up to them. I told you. I twisted my ankle. Can we please stop making such a fuss about this? It's nothing. It's not nothing. Dr. Martin has you on painkillers and something to keep the swelling down. Medications Aiden had to pick up at the local pharmacy on their way home. How did you fall? Miss Doris asked, her eyes taking in every inch of his grandmother. Who said I fell? she asked. The bruise that's forming on your arm. Looks to me like you were trying to break a fall and hit the counter or something. Miss Doris pointed to the offending limb. Sure enough, a bruise the size of a silver dollar pancake had formed and was turning from red to blue. I slipped on a bit of flour on the floor, if you must know. His grandmother let go of his arm and pulled the sleeve of her shirt down. It was my fault. I spilled it and should have swept it up. The guilt about causing his grandmother's pain was gnawing at him. Thankfully, it sounds like it's a minor injury. Claire placed her hand on his arm in support. He took it and squeezed it, letting go, when he noticed three pairs of curious eyes on them. You are right, Claire. It's nothing. I'll be good as new in the morning and with those pain pills. Don't even think about it. You're not working for the next few days, Aiden said, putting as much authority as he could muster into his voice. And who do you expect to do the baking and run the store? You? His grandmother looked up at him, her index finger pointing straight at him. Of course. I've been working alongside you for the past six months and kept the store running while you were in the hospital this summer. A little gratitude would be nice, he thought. You can't work the store full time and do your job, Aiden. I'll be fine. I'll take breaks and close early if I need to. I can help, Claire offered, looking surprised the moment the words were out. That's wonderful. And I will help as well. Between the three of us, we'll keep things going. Before you say anything, Aaron, you can supervise. You're not on bed rest. But if I have any say in this, you will keep that ankle elevated until it's healed. Trust me, you don't want to do too much too soon. Miss Doris shook her arm as if her elbow were bothering her. Aiden wondered if it was an old injury. We better get going. We need to stop at the pharmacy on the way home. Aiden used the key fob to unlock his car. Why don't I give you a ride home in my car? Miss Doris said, looking at his truck. It'll be easier to get into, and I can help you around the shop for a bit. That would be lovely. You don't mind, Aiden, do you? Aiden was surprised. Minutes earlier, his grandmother had seemed annoyed about Miss Doris's concern. Of course. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. It might take a while to get the prescription filled anyway. Claire, are you busy for the next few hours? Miss Doris asked. I'm free. Unless there is something you need help with, Claire said to her mother. And shook her head. I have everything under control. I do need to get home though. I have a few deliveries this afternoon. Why don't you keep Aiden company and then help around the store for a bit? Miss Doris asked. Of course. If you don't mind giving me a ride? Claire turned to look at him. Not at all. He had to force himself to slowly walk around the front of his truck to open the door for her. That takes care of today. Any plans for the rest of the week? 
his grandmother asked as she walked down the street toward Miss Doris's car. Oh, I'm sure we can think of something, Miss Doris said. She probably would. The only problem was, Aiden might not like it. Chapter 10 What's next? Miss Doris asked after pulling a tray of sugar cookies from the oven. Claire moved them to cooling racks. They were snowman and Christmas tree cookies that needed decorating, along with plain sugar cookies. If the thumbprint cookies are ready, they can go in. After that, we'll just have peanut butter cookies to bake. Miss Arend checked a few items off her list. I can get to work on the dough. Miss Doris walked over to the pantry in the shop's kitchen and started pulling ingredients out. The recipe is in the book, Miss Aaron replied, pointing to the large leather-bound book that held her favorite recipes. Each of them was written in ink pen in a neat hand. Claire had spent a pleasant few minutes earlier looking through it. Where's the peanut butter? Miss Doris asked. She stepped deep into the pantry, digging around. It's right in the front. The large jar with the red lid. I can see it from here. Miss Aaron was tapping her fingers on the counter. Claire got the impression the older woman wasn't very good at sitting still. That's the crunchy kind. You can't make peanut butter cookies with that. Miss Doris walked back out of the small room, covered in shelves from floor to ceiling. If you bothered to look at the recipe, you'd see it calls for crunchy peanut butter. It's what I've always used. Miss Aaron rose from the chair they'd placed next to the cash register. Aiden put a hand on her shoulder, quietly requesting she stay put. You seriously expect me to make these? Miss Doris's finger was moving along the page as she scanned the recipe. They are her cookies, Claire said softly, earning her a smile from Aiden. You're right. Your shop, your recipe. Miss Doris retied her apron and started measuring out the ingredients and dumping them into one of the large stainless steel bowls they'd been working with all day. Thank you. Miss Aaron's shoulders relaxed. Small lines were forming around her mouth and eyes. Claire worried she was in more pain than she'd let on. All right. Last batch. After this, it will be closing time. Miss Doris rubbed her hands together and started the mixer. If you bring me some cookie sheets and a scoop, I can work on those cookies here at the counter. Miss Aaron had been doing a little here and there without leaving her chair. I've got it, Claire said. She'd gotten pretty good at portioning out the cookie dough. And I'll flatten them. Aiden had a fork at the ready to press the cookies into their disc shape with the familiar crisscross pattern pressed into them. Hold your horses there, you too. The dough will have to rest for half an hour in the fridge. Miss Doris turned off the mixer, pressed the dough into a tight ball, and covered it with cling wrap. She walked over to the large fridge, shuffling things around until there was enough space. Tomorrow's loaves of sourdough bread were already lined up in their proofing baskets. Why don't I take you upstairs, Grandma? We can finish up here without you. It's time for your meds anyway. Aiden put the fork on the counter and held his arm out for his grandmother. Why don't I help her upstairs and get her settled? You two finish up down here, and I'll make us something for dinner. Miss Doris pulled her apron off and hung it on the hook inside the pantry. If you don't mind. That would be amazing. Aiden's voice was tinged with gratitude. Today must have been harder on him than she realized. What can I do to help you close? She asked after the two older women left to head to the apartment upstairs. You could sweep while I count what's in the register. Aiden walked over to the front door of the shop and locked it, changing the sign from open to close. I don't mind at all. Claire finished washing the last of the dishes, before grabbing the broom. All I Want for Christmas by Mariah Carey came on. Christmas tunes had been playing in the background all day. She turned the music up a hair and got to work. When she turned around Aiden was standing behind the counter, watching her. That was lovely. Had she been singing out loud? Claire didn't think anyone could hear her soft singing. And it was pretty obvious she'd been dancing around with the broom. 
Not only could anyone who walked by see her, Aiden had been watching for who knew how long. Sorry, is this too loud? She ran over to the radio to turn down the volume. Not at all. I'm surprised you like Christmas music, that's all. He moved over and took the broom from her, leaning it against the wall, before pulling her into his arms to dance to the upbeat tune. I don't. This is one of the few I actually like. There's something about it. You can't be tired or in a bad mood when this comes on. She smiled, joy bubbling up in her, between the music and the dancing. This was fun, Aiden said, sounding a little breathless after the song finished. It was. Claire stepped out of his embrace, feeling chilly, without his body close to her own. She picked the broom back up and went back to where she left off. Would you like to have dinner with us? Aiden asked when she finished. The rest of the store was spotless. He must have worked fast to get the counters cleaned, and the kitchen tidied after counting the cash they'd taken in today. Granted, most people had paid with credit or debit cards. Still, she was impressed by his speed. I should get home. My mom might need some help with the party. They'd started prepping the first few batches of cookie dough for her mother's order this afternoon. With Miss Doris's help, filling the order should be no problem, even if Miss Aaron would be out of commission for the better part of a week. Okay. I'll drive you home. Aiden pulled his keys out of his pocket. Thanks. How had she forgotten that she'd come here with him? She stepped out into the cold, Aiden locking the door behind them. You're shaking. Come here. He put his arm around her, pulling her close. It was one of the coldest evenings yet. The sun had set, and their warm breath turned to mist with each exhale. Aiden's truck wasn't far, and he cranked up the heat as soon as they got in. He grabbed a flannel jacket from behind the set and handed it to her. Claire used it as a lap blanket, grateful for the warmth it provided until the car's heat filled the cab. All too soon, they arrived at her parents' house. It was dark, barely a light lit up the building, and none of the Christmas lights were on. Claire wondered what that was about. Thanks for your help, Aiden said, turning toward her. Anytime. I had fun. She pulled the jacket off and handed it to him. I'm glad. His eyes didn't leave hers. Neither of them spoke or moved for a moment. Claire forgot to breathe when he leaned toward her and brushed a strand of hair out of her face. The outside lights came on, including several colorful holiday displays. The front door opened. Claire, is that you? Her father asked, stepping out onto the porch. Coming. Claire yelled, opening the truck door. She turned to look at Aiden, her hand cupping his cheek for a heartbeat, before she turned to climb out. He was pulling out of the driveway when she reached her father on the porch. What was that about? Her dad asked. Claire didn't have an answer for her father. The same question kept rolling around in her mind. What was going on between her and Aiden? They definitely had chemistry. But then, they'd always had that. Did he really only pull away during their senior year, because of sports? She had been clingy, wanting to spend more and more time together. But shouldn't that have been something they could have worked on? Claire shook her head. There was no sense in worrying about spilled milk. The past was the past. The only question was, did they have something now? She'd hoped he'd kiss her in that truck tonight. And if her father hadn't come out, she was pretty sure that's exactly what would have happened. But then what? Was she ready to let go of her life in New York? Maybe. She wasn't so sure what Aiden's idea of the future was. His work and his life had been in Atlanta, prior to this summer. And from the little they'd talked today, it sounded like he planned to head back after the holidays if his grandmother was feeling better. Claire wasn't sure what kind of job prospects she'd have in the southern metropolis. Surely there had to be something for someone with her expertise. Her phone beeped, pulling her out of her thoughts. Brent, hey, babe. Making sure you're doing all right. I still have your keys. I can bring them to the office or drop them off with your super. 
The text came out of the blue. Claire hadn't heard a word from Brent since she ran out of the apartment and got on a bus home. She sat on her bed, staring at the message. Why now? Three dots appeared. Brent, that thing with Stacy didn't mean anything. It was a mistake. Please forgive me. A week ago, she would have considered it. But now, Claire had no desire to forgive and forget. Or maybe she did, but not the way Brent had in mind. At least she didn't think she had feelings left for the man she'd expected to get engaged to this Christmas. Claire was too tired and too confused to reply. She sat her phone on the nightstand and went to get ready for bed. Her phone was blinking when she returned. Brent, before I forget, the company is ready to fill the new editor position for nonfiction. I put you at the top of the list. Expect an offer before Christmas. It was the job she'd wanted since she joined the small publishing house three years ago. She'd been sure the job would go to Stacy. Now it sounded like it was hers. So much for going to sleep early tonight. Claire sighed and pulled a sweater from her dresser before heading downstairs to think. Chapter 11 Thank you for coming back, Aiden said when Miss Doris showed up at the bakery early the next morning. Is Aaron up already? she asked as they walked into the bakery. What do you think? Aiden asked, pointing with his chin in the direction of the kitchen where his grandmother was busy baking sourdough bread and mixing muffin batter. You're supposed to stay off your foot, Miss Doris said sternly. She stashed her purse behind the counter and pulled a fresh apron off the pantry hook. I've been off it all night, and I promised Aiden I'd take breaks throughout the day. A little baking won't hurt. By a little you mean two dozen loaves of bread, a mountain of muffins, and enough cookies to supply the North Pole? Miss Doris grabbed a stack of muffin tins and lined them with colorful paper cups. They were Christmas-themed. White, red, and green cups dotted with small trees, reindeer, and ornaments. There's not that much left to do. Y'all did a wonderful job yesterday. His grandmother finished mixing the batter before handing it over to Miss Doris. Take a break. I'll keep an eye on the loaves, Aiden said, taking the bowl to the sink. I'll be fine. His grandmother pulled a clean bowl out from under the counter, intent on starting the next batch of muffins. No, you won't. Not if you don't let this heal. Did I ever tell you about my elbow injury? Miss Doris asked, motioning for Grandma Erin to sit down. You hinted at it, but I never got the entire story. His grandmother scooped flour into the bowl. If you sit down, I'll tell you. What are we making here? Miss Doris asked. Aiden stood back and watched the two women. If there was anyone in town who could get his grandmother to do something she didn't want to do, it was Miss Doris. Apple streusel muffins, his grandmother said, opening the recipe book to the correct page. Aiden can peel and chop the apples. He did as asked, happy to see his grandmother take her seat in the chair behind the cash register, her leg propped up on an empty crate topped with a pillow from their apartment upstairs. Do you remember the bake sale about 10, 15 years ago when the church needed a new roof? Miss Doris asked. Aiden shook his head, but his grandmother nodded. We needed a nice chunk of change, so I baked pies and cookies for days. I mixed all my pie dough by hand back then. It's easier to judge how much water it needs when you've got your hands in it, Miss Doris said. More nods from his grandmother. Long story short, I overdid it. My elbow was hurting badly enough that I went to see the doctor. He told me to rest it for a few days, but did I listen? Let me guess, you pushed through the pain. I see it in my athletes all the time. Aiden had witnessed several pro careers end because someone tried to tough it out. To his surprise, it was a bigger issue with women than with men. I sure did. We needed the money for that roof. I figured I'd rest after we had the funds. Well, my arm hasn't been the same since and I have no choice but to use my stand mixer if I make more than one pie. And don't even get me started on the aches when the weather turns cold. 
She rubbed her elbow for a moment before getting back to mixing the muffin batter. To Aiden's relief, she was using her other hand to do the mixing. All right, you too. I promise to rest my foot, but I have to do something. His grandmother was wiggling around in her chair. She had ants in her pants. Aiden looked around for something she could do while sitting down. His eyes fell on the large bowl of apples in front of him. Here, you can peel these. I'll do the chopping. He put an empty bowl in his grandmother's lap to catch the peels and a second one on the counter beside her to hold the apples. The three of them worked in companionable silence for a good while. The only noise was the beeping of the oven when the loaves of sourdough bread finished baking. Aiden moved them from the oven to the cooling racks. How are things going with you and Claire? Miss Doris asked. She was scooping batter into prepared muffin tins. We're good. It was nice of her to help yesterday. Aiden wasn't sure where this conversation was going. It's good to see the two of you getting along. From what I remember, it didn't end so well before you both moved away to college. Miss Doris put a tray of muffins into one of the ovens. Doris, that's none of your business. Leave the boy alone. His grandmother had moved on to peeling pears. They were juicy and much harder to peel away from the sink. Oh, please. Like you wouldn't like to see those two getting back together. Miss Doris took the second tray of muffins to the oven. That doesn't mean it's okay to meddle. His grandmother pointed her knife in Miss Doris's direction. Aiden couldn't help but think he was in trouble with both women determined to get him and Claire back together. Not that he minded the idea in general. It was the help he wasn't sure would end well. Aiden was sitting on the couch, finally able to relax and catch up on the sports scores when the doorbell rang. He hoped the sound didn't wake up his grandmother. Aiden rushed to the door, hoping to keep his late-night visitor from ringing it again. He caught sight of the living room clock out of the corner of his eye and chuckled. He was keeping Baker's hours. It was barely eight o'clock. What's so funny? Claire asked when he pulled the door open. She was the last person he'd expected standing in front of him, holding a covered casserole dish. I thought it was much later than it is. He stepped aside, motioning for her to come inside. The air pouring in from the staircase that led up to the second-floor apartment was cold compared to the toasty 78 degrees of his grandmother's apartment. And that's gotten you smiling? Claire walked in, setting the dish on the kitchen counter. It does. I must be tired. I used to not go to bed until close to midnight. These days, he was often out by 10 o'clock or sooner. I won't hold you up then. My mom made a casserole for you and your grandmother. It's chicken, rice, and broccoli and still warm if you're hungry now. Claire pulled the foil from the dish. The smell of the food was mouth-watering. Something with curry and less his nose deceived him. Please, stay. I'm not that tired. It just surprised me it wasn't even eight yet. The food smells delicious. Aiden took two plates from the cabinet. It's pretty good for a casserole. It's my mom's go to funeral dish. Wait, that didn't come out right. Her cheeks turned a rosy color, and Aiden didn't think it was from the warmth of the apartment. I know what you mean. My grandmother has one of those dishes too. Apparently, most of the older women on the island do. He opened the fridge to show her the lineup of casserole dishes that had been dropped off throughout the day. Claire laughed. Looks like you're set for the rest of the week. I should let you and your grandma enjoy your dinner. Have dinner with me? he asked. Grandma is asleep already, and I could use the company. I spent all day with her and Miss Doris. That bad? Claire asked. She sat down at the kitchen table. Aiden took that as a good sign. He scooped them each a generous serving of the curried chicken casserole and took the plates to the table. What can I get you to drink? Water is okay. Claire pushed her hair behind her ears. He poured them each a glass of ice water and joined her at the small wooden table. 
There was just enough room for two people to share a meal. Aiden wasn't sure how his grandmother and grandfather had managed to raise three kids in the small space. Working with Miss Doris and my grandmother was fine. There's a lot of talking when those two get together. The chatter had been almost non-stop, half of it gossiping about anyone and everyone on the island. I can see that happening. It probably didn't make it easy for you to get your own work done. Claire smiled and took a small bite of food. I was able to sneak up here for a couple of calls in the middle of the day. Aiden had gotten lucky. The internet connection held up, and he'd gotten through his client meetings without a hitch. He had a few custom diet plans and reports to create tonight, but all in all it had been one of his easier workdays. Having the extra pair of hands in the shop and someone to keep an eye on his grandmother had been well worth the added chatter. That's good. Is that the plan for the new year? Working from here? Claire asked. Aiden took a bite of the casserole to give himself time to think about how to answer the question that had been in the back of his own mind for weeks. It was delicious, as savory and complex as it smelled. He'd have to thank Aunt Hammond the next time he saw her. And maybe ask for the recipe. He washed the food down with a sip of cold water. I'm not sure. It depends on how my grandmother is doing. Originally, the plan was to move back to Atlanta as soon as possible. But with her falling. It scared you, didn't it? To think what if something like that happened again, with her alone in the bakery. Claire reached across the table, to squeeze his hand. It felt nice. All too soon, she let go, and went back to eating. It gave me something to think about, that's for sure. Could you continue to work remotely? Claire asked. I don't know. Aiden didn't think his chances of continuing this way were great. Yes, his clients loved working with him, but many of them preferred in-person meetings, and he couldn't shake the feeling that his boss was more than ready for Aiden to come back to the office. Claire nodded and took another bite. She looked deep in thought. They ate the rest of their meal quietly. How about you? Did you make a decision about New York? he asked, putting his fork on the empty plate. That's gotten a little more complicated since the last time we talked. Claire rose and sat both of their plates in the sink. How so? If you want to talk about it. Aiden got up and ran hot water on the dishes. Claire covered the remaining casserole with the foil and put the dish into the fridge. He wasn't sure where she found room for it, but somehow, she managed. All that Tetris she'd played in middle school was paying off. I was offered a promotion, she said when Aiden had convinced himself she didn't want to talk to him about her job. That's nice. Congratulations. Claire smiled wryly. I'm not sure I want to take it. Which stinks, because it's the job I've wanted since I got to New York. Editor? Yes. With my own clients and for the non-fiction arm, which is my favorite. What's the problem? Aiden asked, washing the plates and setting them on the drying rack. I'd be working even closer with Brent. Claire picked up the kitchen towel and dried off the first plate. Ah. I see the dilemma. What do you think you're going to do? Go back? I'm not sure. It's what I've always wanted, she said. Chapter 12 Claire, can you get that? Her mother asked when the doorbell rang. Sure thing. Claire jogged down the hall and pulled the front door open. I brought the cookies. The second set of trays is in the truck. Aiden stood in front of her, holding a stack of cookie platters. Come on in. I guess these should go into the kitchen. She walked ahead of him, through the foyer and into the large kitchen where her mother was busy setting out glasses. The catering crew were bustling around as well. The entire house was buzzing with anticipation of tonight's holiday party. Where do you want these? Aiden asked, looking first at Claire, then at Anne. You can line them up on the breakfast bar. The caterers will take it from there. And pointed to the marble-topped counter. I'll help you get the rest of them, Claire said when he'd put them all down. 
Not for the first time today, she wondered exactly how many people her mother expected tonight. She'd mentioned 50 to 70 people, but there was enough food here to feed a couple of hundred people. Thanks. Aiden handed her two of the trays when they walked out to his truck, grabbing the last three himself. How's your grandmother today? Claire asked. She's hanging in there. I sent her upstairs to rest and closed the store for the day. She kind of overdid it with these cookies. Aiden shook his head and pushed the truck door, closed with his hip. Why didn't you call? I could have come back to help. Claire walked into the house. That's kind of you, but I'm sure you had plenty to do here, he said. He wasn't wrong. This is the last of them, Mrs. Hammond, Aiden said when they'd put the trays with the others on the counter. It took the entire length of the breakfast bar to hold the large silver trays. I can't thank you enough. Miss Aaron's cookies always make this party special. I was worried she wouldn't be able to manage this year. I know this is last minute, but why don't you and your grandmother join us tonight? Her mother lifted the foil off the tray of coconut cookies, sneaking one and rearranging the rest to make it less obvious one was missing. I wish I could, but I was telling Claire she overdid it a little today. I think it's better we stay in, and I let her get her rest. Aiden's voice was tinged with regret. Claire saw him scanning the room next door where the caterers were setting up the hot and cold buffet for tonight. That's a shame. I'm sure Claire would have loved to have you here. She's a little worried about mingling by herself, her mother said in a half-whisper. I'm right here, Mom. Claire shook her head, more amused than annoyed. You'll be fine. Everyone loves you, Claire. Aiden took her hand and squeezed it, earning them a questioning look from her mother. I'll walk you out, Claire said, pulling her hand away. She did not need any more rumors swirling around before everyone arrived. Tell your grandmother I hope she feels better and that I definitely want her here next year. Her mother waved as Claire pulled Aiden down the hall and out the door. She wasn't wrong, you know. I wish you could be here tonight. If nothing else, I'd have a friendly face to talk to. Claire leaned against the tailgate of his truck. What are you so worried about? Aiden asked. The gossip. I'm not ready to talk about what happened in New York before I came down. I don't want them to judge me for still being single still renting an apartment, and still being stuck in an entry-level position. Sounds to me you're more worried about having to face what you want your life to be and what it is right now. Maybe you're right, Claire said. And as far as tonight goes, you have nothing to worry about. There will be plenty of friendly faces, ready to welcome you home with open arms. This is Palmer Island, after all. Aiden grinned. Maybe you're right. Claire felt a little more optimistic about the evening ahead. Claire, Mom wants us down there, to greet guests. Brooke walked into her bedroom, closing the door behind her. I'm almost ready. Can you help me zip this up? Claire turned and Brooke pulled the zipper up on the midnight blue dress. You look beautiful. Aiden's jaw would drop if he could see you right now. Brooke sat down on Claire's bed. Not you too, Claire groaned. She walked to the closet and pulled the shoebox down. Oh, come on. Let me live a little. It's been a long time since I've dated someone. How are things with you and Aiden? Claire slipped into the silver sandals she'd chosen to go under the dress. They gave it just enough sparkle when her toes peeked out. We're old friends. I'm not buying that. I saw the way the two of you were looking at each other earlier. Brooke grinned and took the necklace Claire was trying to put on and helped her fasten it. It's a little nostalgia, that's all. He's moving back to Atlanta as soon as his grandmother can manage by herself, and I have a life in New York. I'm not buying that either. There's no way you're going back to work with that jerk every day. Brooke put her arm around Claire. I haven't made up my mind. She had a little time to think about the new job offer. Not much, but tonight wasn't the night to make that decision. All right, let me know when you do. 
Ava and Evan would love to have you around more often. As would I. Brooke opened the door, and the two of them walked downstairs. The foyer, living room, and kitchen were decked out in Christmas decorations and lights. Soft holiday music was playing throughout the house. There you two are. People are arriving. Come, stand with us and welcome them. And was standing next to her husband, both of them dressed in formal evening wear. Claire forgot how good her dad looked in a tux. It didn't take long for the first few guests to arrive. Everyone was anxious to get here. Her mother's event was the party to attend on Palmer Island in December. It's nice to see you again, Claire. I'm sure your parents love to have you home for the holidays. Pam Davenport picked up a glass of champagne and one of Miss Aaron's sugar and spice cookies. Thank you, it's nice to be back. Mrs. Davenport was the fifth person to talk to her. The entire town knew this was an unplanned visit, but not one of them made a comment about Brent or the Colorado trip. Everyone was happy to see her. It's too bad Sophie and Simon couldn't make it tonight. They would have loved to spend some time with you. How long are you in town? Sophie, Miss Davenport's daughter, ran the local bookstore. Claire had been a frequent customer before her move to New York. At least through the new year. Tell Sophie, I'll stop by the store before Christmas. I'd love to see that baby of hers. I will. Mrs. Davenport walked off to speak to her mother. How are you holding up, sis? Brooke asked. So far, so good. It's been a lot easier than I expected. Claire knew that people were a lot friendlier here on the island than in New York City. Part of it was the attitude of South Carolinians. New Yorkers as a whole were a judgy bunch. But there was more to it than that. People here were supportive. They'd known her Claire's entire life and embraced her, faults and all. I wish I could say the same. Keeping Ava and Evan from breaking decorations or polishing off an entire tray of snowman cookies hasn't been easy. At least Evan is getting tired. Max is upstairs, trying to get him to go to sleep. Good luck with that. Miss Doris walked up to join them. Mrs. Blackwell was right behind her. Good luck with what? Mrs. Blackwell asked. Getting her little boy to sleep upstairs. I don't know about Rachel, but my boys would not fall asleep when this kind of excitement was going on around them. Miss Doris waved her hand at the throng of people around them. True. I'm sure he'll be back down in a minute. If not, you know he was completely exhausted. I'm surprised Aiden isn't here tonight, Miss Doris said. Mom invited him and Miss Aaron, but he thought it was too much for her. He said she overdid it with the baking this morning. Claire took a glass of champagne to have something in her hands. I'm sure he would have loved to see you in this dress and twirl you around the dining room. Mrs. Blackwell touched the dress. What makes you say that? Claire asked, afraid of what the answer might be. Oh, I was walking by the bakery the other night right after dark. I saw the two of you swaying to what sounded like Christmas music. You looked very cozy. I'm glad you're getting back together. I always said that the two of you made the most adorable couple. Mrs. Blackwell toasted her with a glass of red wine. Miss Doris shook her head. How did I miss this? I'm losing my touch. Chapter 13 When are you planning on coming back? It was the question Aiden had been dreading. He'd had a feeling the phone call with his boss wasn't good news. I'm not sure. My grandmother fell a few days ago. She's getting back on her feet, but her heart is still weak. I'm afraid to leave her alone. And there's no one else who could take care of her. This was supposed to be a short-term solution while you arranged long-term care if needed. I know. I'm doing what I can, he said. I need you back in the office after New Year's. It'll get crazy with everyone making New Year's resolutions and the players bringing in their wives and girlfriends. I'll do my best. It was all he could promise right now. 
All right, but I hope you understand that I'll have to look for someone else to fill your position if you plan to stay on that island of yours. The phone beeped, and the line was dead. The perfect ending to a perfectly crappy morning. He'd overslept and found his grandmother working away in the bakery when he made his way down. There was no coffee and his first client Zoom meeting kept lagging and eventually dropping altogether. He'd had to finish up over the phone, which was less than ideal when you were dealing with a football quarterback who was a bit of a drama queen. Aiden was sure that call was the reason for the check-in from his boss. I'm going to get some air for a minute, he told his grandmother. The shop was quiet after the usual Monday morning rush, and Miss Doris was back to help around the shop. Put on a jacket. It's cold out there, his grandmother called after him. Aiden pretended not to hear her. The cold air and bright sun made him feel marginally better. He leaned against the warm bricks of the outside of the building when he caught sight of a familiar person out of the corner of his eye. Claire was walking toward him, wearing tight jeans and a red wool sweater. She carried the silver platters they'd arranged cookies on the day before. Let me take these, he said, rushing toward her and holding his hands out for the trays. I've got it. She walked right past him toward the entrance of the bakery. He quickly stepped around her and opened the door. The heat from the bakery hit him like a wall. Hello, Claire. It's nice to see you. Are those my platters? His grandmother stepped out from behind the counter and took the silver trays. They are. My mother sends her thanks. The cookies were a big hit, as always. Claire smiled, and it did something funny to his insides, seeing her full of joy. Tell her she's most welcome. I'm sorry we had to miss the party. My grandson over here insisted I take it easy last night. His grandmother shook her head. And he was right. You keep trying to do too much. Miss Doris walked out of the back and took the platters from his grandmother. Aiden felt decidedly useless. Any plans for today? he asked Claire. Not really. Believe it or not, the house is already back to normal, and my parents are taking the kids up to the aquarium. I'll probably hang out at home until they get back. Why don't the two of you go out and do something fun? Aiden could use the distraction, and Aaron and I have things covered here, Miss Doris said. What do you think? he asked. Sure. As long as it's got nothing to do with Christmas, I'm game. After last night, I need a break from the holiday stuff. Claire grinned, and he got the feeling the evening hadn't been as bad as she'd feared. Give me a second to grab my jacket, and we can head out. Aiden jogged upstairs. A minute later, he was back. His grandmother and Miss Doris had their heads together, whispering back and forth about something. Aiden figured he was better off not knowing what this was about. Don't worry, I'll take care of it, Miss Doris said when they noticed him. Where's Claire? he asked. She wasn't anywhere in the bakery. She said she'd wait for you in her car. His grandmother was back in her chair, Miss Doris busy washing the platters Claire had brought. All right. I have my phone on me. Call me if it gets busy. I can be back in 15 minutes, Aiden said. Stop worrying and have some fun, his grandmother said. Aiden nodded and made his way to Claire's car. Where to, she asked. I don't know. What did you have in mind? There wasn't much to do that didn't involve Christmas in one way or the other this time of year. Palmer Island went all out with events, the holiday festival, and decorations everywhere. What about the arcade by the pier? Claire asked, a glint of excitement in her eyes. That works for me. Best out of five? Claire asked, a little out of breath. They'd been playing arcade hoops for 20 minutes straight and, so far, Aiden had won every single one of them. The amount of tickets the machine was spitting out for him was impressive. Are you sure you want to go again? We can move to something else. What was that bug game you used to like? Aiden spun around, looking at the colorful, lit-up games that surrounded them. I think it's gone, and no, I want to win at least one game against you. 
and no cheating and letting me win either. Her heart was racing with the excitement of the challenge. She'd forgotten how much fun it was to go out and play, forgetting about life, responsibilities, and decisions to be made about potential job offers. All right. It's your funeral. He picked up the first basketball and started speed shooting. The first one went in. The second one did as well. Claire shook her head and forced herself to focus on her own game. The first ball went to the left, the next four went in. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Aiden miss a shot. She wasn't sure if it was intentional or not, but she'd take it. It gave her a chance to at least tie this round. Which is exactly what happened. You're getting better, Aiden said. Two more weeks of practice, and I might actually give you a run for your money. Claire couldn't keep the grin off her face. Who cared that she didn't win, or that her string of tickets was minute compared to his? She was enjoying herself, and at the end of the day, that was all that counted. Let's play something else. You pick this time, Aiden said. He must have forgotten that she picked this game when they first arrived. You've got it. She looked around the room. It was loud, lights flashing, games making noises. There was a bit of Christmas music playing in the background and a few Santa hats and candy canes dotted around the room, but all in all, it was the least decked out place on the entire island. Don't forget to grab your CVS receipt, she teased. Aiden laughed. It was the first time she'd heard it since they'd reconnected, and it touched her heart. I won't. But if I did, I'm pretty sure it would make that kid's day. He nodded in the direction of the eight-year-old, Claire, had noticed as well. He wasn't playing any games. Instead, he was moving around the space, looking at machines, and collecting the occasional ticket left here and there. I wonder what's up with that, Claire said. Maybe there's a toy he really wants. Aiden took his long string of tokens, leaving four of the paper tickets behind. They walked across the room and stood beside one of the coin-pushing machines to watch what he would do. The boy spotted the tickets and strode over, pretending to check one of the basketballs before reaching down and palming them. He stuck them into his pants pocket and walked away, surveying the room for his next score. I think you're right. He keeps glancing over at the prize booth. Claire recognized the gleam of longing in the boy's eyes. We'll help him out a little. What do you want to play next? Aiden looked around the room, skipping the racing game she knew he liked. The dancing one? No tokens from that one. How about whack-a-mole? Without giving him a chance to answer, she walked over and put coins into two adjacent machines. I guess whack-a-mole it is. I have to warn you though, my reaction time is even better than it was in high school. He grinned and pulled the plastic mallet out. I sure hope so, otherwise this would be a boring game to play. I used to beat you every single time back in the day. Because I let you. Aiden winked, his hand hovering over the bright red start button. No way. Ready? She pushed the button, gaining a half a second advantage over Aiden. The noise and lights of the arcade faded. Claire was entirely focused on the little critters in front of her, poking their heads up at random intervals. You cheated, Aiden said when the round ended. I did not. I reacted faster, that's all. Claire laughed. She beat him. Barely, but she had the higher score. Both of them had a nice string of tickets coming out. Claire looked over her shoulder. The young boy was eyeing them. How many tickets do you need? Claire called in his direction. He walked over, eyes on the string of tickets, doubt written all over his childish face. 232. Something in that ticket booth you've got your eye on? Aiden asked. He nodded. The train toy. Claire looked at the prizes displayed and noticed Aiden doing the same. The toy in question looked like something a toddler would play with. You sure? More nodding. It's for my little brother. For Christmas. The boy's cheeks reddened as did the tips of his ears. What's your name? Aiden asked. Tim, Tim took a step back. 
That's very nice of you to get a gift for your little brother. I'm sure we can help. I have at least 200 tickets here and plenty of tokens left. Let's see what we can do. Aiden handed Tim a handful of the small silver coins that were used to play the games. Skee-ball gives you the most tickets, Tim said. If you're any good. Oh, we're pretty good, Claire said. She walked over to the row of skee-ball machines on the back wall to prove her point. They played until they ran out of coins, racking up an impressive amount of tickets. Why don't you grab us some ice cream while I go help Tim here pick out that present for his little brother? Aiden stood next to Tim, giving her that look that she knew all too well. He was going to get this taken care of, no matter what it took, which in this case may mean a small bribe to the arcade owner without Tim noticing. Great plan. What kind of ice cream do you like, Tim? My treat. Claire smiled at the boy encouragingly. I'm not supposed to take things from strangers. My mom is probably going to be mad when she finds out that I talked to you too. He looked over his shoulder, expecting his mother to walk in on them. Good advice. Tell you what, Claire is going to order me some ice cream and if there happens to be an extra double chocolate chunk, we'll set it on the table next to us and you can take it or leave it, Aiden said. Could it be an extra brownie explosion? Tim asked with a sly grin. I'm sure it could be, Claire said, biting her lip to keep from laughing. Great. I'm going to go turn in my tickets, and if you happen to be at the counter at the same time and could use a few extras, then that's nothing but a lucky coincidence. Aiden walked toward the prize booth, Tim less than a step behind him. Chapter 14 Did you guys have enough tokens? Claire asked when she heard Aiden walk up behind her. Two cups of homemade ice cream were waiting in front of her. As agreed, she'd set the brownie explosion on the table next to theirs. We sure did. And there was just enough left over to get this. He stepped around the table in front of her and held up the biggest teddy bear she'd ever seen. The thing was enormous, wearing a Santa hat and holding a plush candy cane in one paw. Tim held the plastic train set up to show her before sliding into the chair and digging into his ice cream. That was very kind of you, Claire said softly, her eyes locked with Aiden's. She'd always known he was a sweet guy, but seeing him reach out and help the young boy next to them made her heart melt a little. When had she forgotten what a great man Aiden was and how easy it was to be around him? It was nothing. I had fun today. I'd forgotten that you have a competitive streak too. His smile made his eyes twinkle and gave her that butterfly feeling in her stomach. She couldn't remember the last time she'd felt this relaxed and this excited at the same time. I had a good time too. Claire looked over at Tim. The little boy was scraping the last of the ice cream out of the cup. He rose and waved. Thank you for the tickets and the ice cream, he said, before running out of the arcade and down the street. Should we have taken him home? Claire asked, looking after the boy worriedly. He was weaving in and out to avoid the people rushing up and down the sidewalk. Then she lost sight of him. Nah, he's fine. He doesn't live far from here, and his mom should be home from work by now. Aiden glanced at his phone. You talked to him about that? Claire asked. Aiden nodded. He was quite chatty once we made it to the prize counter. Any word from your grandmother? she asked. He shook his head. But you want to go check up on her, see how things are going in the bakery? If you don't mind. We've been gone for almost two hours. I know Miss Doris will keep an eye on my grandmother, but those two don't always get along. Of course. Let's head back. I'm not sure where to put this guy though. Claire put an arm around the teddy bear Aiden had sat in the chair next to her. It took up more room than an average adult man. He can ride in the back seat, Aiden suggested, before picking up the bear. Claire returned the ice cream bowls and followed him out to the parking lot. It took both of them, but they managed to cram the bear in the back seat of her mother's Lexus. It didn't take long to drive from the arcade to the bakery. Claire pulled into the back lot and parked close to the back door of the shop. Thanks for coming out with me. 
You have no idea how much I needed this. My parents' house looks like the North Pole exploded inside of it. Claire tucked her hair behind her ear, suddenly feeling nervous and a little breathless. I did too. Aiden went quiet, staring out the window at the brick wall and steel door that made up the back entrance of his grandmother's bakery. We should do it again, sometime soon. Claire didn't want this day to end. She reached over and ran her fingers through his hair. It was as soft and silky as she remembered. She'd dreamed about this the past few nights. Being close to him. Touching him. That feels nice. Aiden's voice was husky. He turned slowly to face her as if he was afraid that any sudden movement would make her stop. It does. All thought of forming coherent sentences flew out the window when he reached up and cupped her cheek. His hands were warm, despite the cold temperatures outside. Even the inside of the canvas top car was chilly, but she barely noticed. What Claire did notice was the feeling of that warm hand on her cheek. She pressed into it, wanting, needing more contact with him. His eyes were on hers, and she saw the desire she felt reflected in them. Yet, he hesitated. Claire's mind was too fuzzy and happy to try to figure out what that was about, but she was having none of it. Raising in her seat, she leaned across the center console, using her hold on the back of his head to pull him closer. Her lips touched his, soft and even warmer than his hands. They melted, she melted, and then there was only the two of them and a kiss that was as familiar as the sun and the moon. It was home. Miss Doris, it's nice to see you again. Claire didn't expect to see the older woman sitting in her mother's kitchen when she came down to grab a cup of coffee the next morning. I was surprised you didn't come inside when you dropped Aiden off. What did you do to the poor man? He was distracted the rest of the afternoon. Miss Doris smiled knowingly over her coffee. Claire's mother shot her a questioning look. We played for a while at the arcade and helped a little boy win a present for his baby brother. Claire dug around the cabinet for her favorite mug before pouring a lot of coffee and hazelnut creamer into it. She liked her coffee the color of a vanilla wafer. That's nice. Someone you know? Her mother asked. Claire shook her head. I don't think that's what had him so befuddled, but you two keep your secrets. For now. Miss Doris wiggled her eyebrows. Claire almost spit out her coffee. She'd heard of people doing this, but had never seen it in action. And she certainly hadn't expected it out of a respectable older woman like Mrs. Doris Williams, widow, and resident home baker of Palmer Island. She did, however, have a reputation as a bit of a matchmaker. Not that Claire was completely opposed to the idea of the woman working her magic on her and Aiden. If she stayed in South Carolina. Miss Doris is here to ask a favor of you, her mother said. Claire was grateful for the change of subject. Of course. Anything. She had a sinking feeling she might regret the statement as soon as the words left her mouth. Great. I had several people drop out of the Christmas concert at the church tomorrow night. The flu is going around. We badly need a soprano, and I remembered you sang in the choir in high school. You don't mind singing a few Christmas songs with us, do you? I haven't done any singing in years. Other than in the shower, and Claire was pretty sure that didn't count. Don't worry, it's like riding a bicycle. Once you know how, you can do it for life. We're meeting for rehearsal tonight at 5. The concert starts at 7 tomorrow evening. Be there by 6, and we'll run through the program again. I brought sheet music, but it's all Christmas classics. I'm sure you know these by heart. Miss Doris pulled a stack of papers out of her large black leather purse and handed them to Claire. Claire scanned the pages quickly. Miss Doris was right. She knew every one of the songs and had sung them in high school choir. With a little practice, she could probably do this. I'm sure Claire would love to help, wouldn't you? Her mother asked. I can't promise I'll be good, but I'm happy to try, Claire said. Wonderful. Oh, and Claire, wear that blue dress from the other night. 
you'll fit right in. Claire couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the request than fitting in with the local church choir. Miss Doris rose and took her leave before she had time to ask. I'm glad you're singing again. Your dad and I will be there, and I'll call Brooke right now. This is exciting. Her mother's smile was infectious, but Claire couldn't shake the feeling that she'd agreed to walk into a trap. Chapter 15 I would like to go to the Christmas concert in church tonight. I can get Doris to take me if you're too tired. Aiden's grandmother was pulling several outfits out of her closet. They were her good clothes, things she wore to church on Sunday. Aiden was comfortable on the couch. He'd taken a shower after a long day at the bakery. He'd texted Claire, hoping to take her out to dinner, but she'd said she was busy with family stuff. It had sounded a bit cagey, but after one fun date at the arcade, he didn't feel he had a right to monopolize her time, no matter how amazing their first kiss in years had been. It was a strange feeling, new and exciting and familiar at the same time. Thinking about her and the kiss had kept him awake long past midnight. When he finally fell asleep, she'd sneaked into his dreams. Every fiber of his body was aching to see her again. To hold her, to kiss her. Aiden? Are you going with me, or am I calling Doris? His grandmother stepped in front of him, dressed in a pretty dark green dress, a burgundy red cardigan slung over her left arm. The cane she'd been using to walk longer distances in her right hand. When had she gotten changed? How long had he sat her in a daze, daydreaming of Claire? The basketball game on the flat screen he'd bought for his grandmother this summer was already ten minutes into the first half. His team was leading 35 to 30. The tap of her cane focused his attention. I'll go with you, he said, turning the TV off. Hurry up. It starts in less than 20 minutes, and it will take some time to find a parking spot. His grandmother's look was stern, the cane tapping impatiently. All right. Give me five minutes to change into jeans and a shirt. He jumped up and jogged down the hall to his bedroom. Wear your suit and that pretty green tie. It looks nice with your eyes. His grandmother was making her way down the hallway. Aiden pushed the door shut and locked it for good measure. Despite what the woman thought, he was no longer eleven years old and didn't need her to lay out his clothes. He was tempted to slip into his favorite pair of jeans and pull a nice sweater over the long sleeve t shirt he'd put on after his shower. Hesitating for just a moment, he put the pants back down and pulled one of the two suits he'd brought with him out of the closet. It was a small thing to do to make his grandmother happy. He couldn't remember the last time he'd worn a suit and tie. Not since Atlanta. Back when he was meeting with clients in person, he'd been required to wear a suit for the first few meetings, but here, there was little opportunity to dress up. Aiden found he didn't miss it, especially as he buttoned the wool pants and tied the tie. Pulling the knot close, memories of working an entire 12-hour day in this kind of outfit came back. The bakery was a lot of work but the dress code was infinitely better than this. Ready to go, his grandmother asked when he walked back into the living room. She stepped up and adjusted his tie. Not that it needed it. She reached up and caressed his cheek. Am I decent enough for church? Aiden asked. He grinned, knowing he looked pretty good in his suit. It hadn't been cheap, but worth every penny. You clean up nice. I can't wait for Doris and some of the other women to see how handsome my grandson is. She turned and picked up her purse. Aiden wondered who the other women were and if one of them was the pretty young blonde who'd occupied much of his thoughts for the past two days. Ready? He held out his arm and walked her down the steps and to his truck. Aiden pulled the door open for her, and within minutes, they pulled into the almost full parking lot of the church. This was a bigger event than he'd realized. The building was lit up inside and out. They were greeted by the soft light of candles and two large lit-up Christmas trees. Soft organ music was playing in the background as they entered the church. Aidan let his grandmother take the lead. She walked to the front of the chapel, slipping into the second row of seats, 
giving them a perfect view of the small stage centered between the Christmas trees and lit by large white pillar candles. Aidan looked around. The church wasn't quite full, but aside from the first few rows, it was well occupied. The side door opened, letting in a rush of cold air along with the Palmer Island Choir. The men and women took their seats. Claire is joining the choir for tonight, in case you didn't know. His grandmother's voice was barely a whisper. He hadn't known. Claire didn't say a word when they spoke yesterday, just mentioned she was busy the next two nights. Now he knew why. His jaw dropped when he spotted Claire off to the side in the first row. She looked stunning in a floor-length, midnight blue gown that had the tiniest bit of sparkle to it. Her face glowed in the soft light of the candles. It gave her blonde locks a soft honey undertone. Her eyes were shining, joy spread across her face. He'd forgotten how much she'd loved to sing. But he would never forget the way she looked right then. Radiant, happy, and absolutely stunning. It was a lovely concert. Claire, you did amazing. His grandmother walked up to Claire and her family as they exited the church and pulled her into a tight hug. Thank you. It was a last-minute thing, and I was a little worried. It's been a while since I've done any singing. Claire's cheeks turned the loveliest shade of pink. It brought out the color of her lips. She was smiling, and Aiden had a hard time taking his eyes off her. You could have fooled me. It sounded like you'd been part of the choir all along, Miss Aaron said. I couldn't agree more. Thank you again for filling in. The sopranos would have sounded pretty anemic if it wasn't for you. Miss Doris said, walking up behind them. Thank you. It was fun. Claire clasped her hands behind her back. Aidan stepped forward and gave her a quick embrace. You were lovely, he whispered into her ear before releasing her. You did a wonderful job, honey, her father said, putting his arm around Claire protectively. It was a lovely evening. You outdid yourself with the decorations, Doris. His grandmother turned to look at her friend. I couldn't agree more. This is always such a special event. Well, we better get out of here. The preacher looks like he's ready to call it a night. Why don't the three of you join us for dinner? Mrs. Hammond asked. Oh, we couldn't possibly impose. His grandmother shook her head and put her hand on his arm. You're not imposing at all. I made a huge pot of beef stew this afternoon. We'd love to have you over. I promise it's more than enough food, Claire's mother said. She isn't kidding. You would save us from having to eat leftover stew for days. Brooke, Matt, and the kids went up to North Myrtle Beach for some Christmas light show thing with friends and are having dinner out. Mr. Hammond explained. Are you sure? Miss Doris asked. I have a couple of loaves of sourdough bread at the bakery, his grandmother said. We can swing by on the way over and pick them up, Aidan said. And I have a pecan pie I can bring for dessert, if that suits everyone. Miss Doris looked around the group. Both of those sound like lovely additions. We'll head home and we'll have the stew ready when you get there. Mrs. Hammond nodded and made her way through the church door, her husband following closely behind. I'll see you in a few, Claire said before joining them. Stop looking at her with your mouth open. His grandmother's smile softened the words. He knew she was teasing him. And she was right. Let's go pick up that bread I promised. To save time, Aidan told his grandmother to wait in the truck while he ran in and grabbed two of the crusty loaves that hadn't sold earlier in the day. If they stuck them in the oven at Claire's house for a few minutes, they'd be good as new. That was exactly what his grandmother did as soon as they walked in. Everything should be ready in a few minutes, Mrs. Hammond said. She and Claire were busy setting the table in the dining room. Mr. Hammond brought up two bottles of red wine. By the time the bread was warm and cut into thick slices, everything was ready. The stew smelled amazing and tasted even better. This is excellent, Aidan said with his gaze on Mrs. Hammond as he reached across the table for another piece of bread to dunk into the rich gravy. 
his hand collided with someone else's as they reached for the same piece. It was Claire, and she was blushing again. Aiden covered his surprise with a small cough. Go ahead, she said, holding up the basket for him. Thank you. He sat the slice on his plate, his mouth dry. I'm glad you like it. Mrs. Hammond smiled at him across the table. Mr. Hammond cleared this throat before reaching for a slice of his own. Aiden, do you plan to stay on the island for good? Claire's father asked. He dipped the bread in the rest of his stew and took a bite. No, sir. The plan is to go back to Atlanta as soon as my grandmother can manage on her own. Aiden took a sip of water. That had been the plan, though it didn't seem as attractive as it had a few weeks ago. I see. Mr. Hammond shot a look at his wife and then his daughter. You like it down there in the big city? There are a lot of benefits to living in Atlanta, Aiden said. He couldn't think of a single one of them, but he remembered having a good time with friends. I'm sure there is. And there are a lot of benefits to living here on the island, Miss Doris added. It's hard to beat a close-knit community, his grandmother added. And there's no traffic. Claire raised her water glass in a salute of sorts. I'm not missing rush hour, that's for sure. Aiden grinned. Miss Doris chuckled. The worst you'll see here is getting stuck behind a golf cart driver who doesn't pull over. Or everyone leaving church. His grandmother put her spoon into her bowl, finished with dinner. Why don't you guys go get comfortable in the living room? Claire and I will clean up and then we can cut into that delicious pie. Mrs. Hammond rose and started stacking plates and bowls together, her daughter following close behind. We'll help. Many hands make light work, his grandmother said. Miss Doris nodded in agreement before shushing the men out of the room. Would you care for a bourbon? Mr. Hammond asked as Aiden followed him to the living room. No, thank you. I'm driving. He sat at the front of the couch, trying to figure out what they could talk about. You and my daughter are spending a good bit of time together. I hope you don't mind me asking. How serious is this? Mr. Hammond poured himself a finger full of bourbon before adding several ice cubes. We're friends. That's all. It had to be. He lived in Atlanta. Claire was possibly going back to New York. Long-distance relationships rarely worked. He hoped if he kept repeating those facts to himself, he would start to believe them. Really? Seems like more than that to me. Claire's father took a seat in the chair across from Aiden. Maybe if circumstances were different. But they are not, and you have lives thousands of miles away from each other. And no interest in changing that? The man's eyes were on him, watching his face carefully. Interest isn't the issue. At least not for me. What is the problem, then? Mr. Hammond asked. Making a living. There aren't too many openings for a sports nutritionist here on the island. Or the greater area. Even in Myrtle Beach, the market was almost non-existent without a major sports franchise in town. I see. I hope you keep this in mind over the coming days and weeks when it comes to my daughter. Don't break her heart again, Aiden. She didn't take it so well last time. Aiden nodded before the women entered, carrying plates of pie and cups of coffee. Claire walked him and his grandmother out at the end of the night. What did you and my dad talk about in there? Chit-chat, about Atlanta and sports mostly. He opened the door for his grandmother and helped her inside. You looked a little freaked out. Claire walked with him around to the other side. Aiden paused when they reached the tail of his truck. It was nothing. I was wondering, though. Would you like to go on an actual date with me? Dinner and a movie in Myrtle Beach, maybe? Mr. Hammond was right. He needed to be sure of what both of them wanted before this went any further. Maybe a date would clarify things for them. If nothing else, it got them out of town and away from prying eyes and nosy neighbors. Let me think about it, Claire said. She kissed him quickly on the cheek and strode back into the house. 
Chapter 16 What's gotten you looking so worried this morning? Her father asked when he walked into the kitchen early the next morning. What makes you think I'm worried? Claire shut her laptop and took another sip of coffee, hoping it would wake her up and help her make the decision she needed to make. You're up before your mother for one. Her father pulled a coffee cup from the cabinet and poured himself a cup. I get up early all the time in New York, she said. I'm sure you do, but you're not working right now. Spit it out. What's got you waking up before the sun rises? I have an offer for a promotion at the publishing house. I'd finally make editor, with my own projects and clients. Congratulations, honey. You've worked long and hard for that. His smile fell when she didn't return it. I would still be working closely with Brent, I think. And they want me to come in for an interview first thing tomorrow morning. And there was no way she'd make it on a Greyhound bus in time. There's an early morning flight out of Myrtle Beach. You could be back down here that night or stay a couple days in New York and still make it back for Christmas, her father said. I know. But, she'd checked the flights. They were all way out of her price range, even if she was willing to run up her credit card. Money? Her father asked. Claire nodded. Don't worry about it. I'll pay. He pulled his credit card from his wallet and handed it to her. Dad, you don't. I know I don't. I want to. It's an amazing opportunity for you, and I want you to have a chance to consider if that's what you want to do. Book the flight and go pack. I'll drive you to the airport tomorrow morning. Thanks, Dad. Claire rose and put her coffee cup in the sink. Of course, honey. It's my job. He smiled at her over his own cup. Claire headed upstairs to pack and to think. Was working as an editor at a big New York publishing house still what she wanted? And if not, where could she see herself two, five, or even ten years down the road? There was a lot she needed to think about, and if she was completely honest with herself, some of it depended on a certain guy with a smile that could melt icebergs who was probably busy baking bread at this very moment. Are you sure you wouldn't rather go up to Myrtle Beach? Aiden asked as he pulled into the parking lot of Luigi's. Claire shook her head. Pizza sounds great, and I can't stay out too late. I'll explain inside. She hopped out of the truck before he could ask any more questions that she wasn't sure she knew how to answer. Welcome to the Luigi's. Table for two, the hostess asked. Claire nodded, and they were seated in a cozy corner of the Italian restaurant. We're inside. Aiden looked at her, one eyebrow raised. Let's figure out what we want to eat first. I hear their pizza is pretty good. Maybe not New York good, but you could see the brick oven from here, flames heating it from below. Pizza sounds good. Aiden put the menu down and crossed his arms. Meat lovers? Claire asked, her lips twitching up. What else? They have about 25 different pizzas on the menu. The spinach, mushroom, and Alfredo one sounds good. Aiden shook his head, looking disgusted. Lettuce doesn't belong on pizza. And the sauce is supposed to be red. Claire laughed and shook her head. He was as opinionated and picky about his food as he'd been as a teenager. Welcome to Luigi's. My name is Gabriella. What can I get you two to drink? A bottle of table red, maybe? The young waitress pulled a notepad from her apron, ready to take their order. I'll take some sweet tea, if you have it, Aiden said. Gabriella nodded. And I'll have a glass of unsweetened tea with lots of ice. Claire directed her attention back to the pizza menu. By the time Gabriella returned with their drinks and a basket of warm bread sticks, she'd made her choice. Ready to order, or do you need a few minutes, she asked as she handed them their glasses. Aiden looked at Claire. I think we're ready. One meat lovers and one BLT pizza and plates to share, please, Claire said. She had to hold back a grin at Aiden's shocked expression. She wasn't sure if it was because she'd ordered for them both or because of her choice of pizza. Great choices. 
I'll have that out to you in a little while. In the meantime, enjoy those breadsticks. We make them in-house, and the marinara sauce is an old family recipe. You'll love it. Gabriella left, ready to take the order of the family of four who'd been seated two tables over. I'm not eating that. Aiden crossed his arms and stared at her. I thought you liked meat lover's pizza, she teased. You know what I mean. I'm not tasting a BLT pizza. That's a sandwich. Claire laughed. Trust me, you'll like it if you can keep an open mind. You've had this before? His expression morphed from stern to surprised. There's a restaurant on the Upper East Side that has it on the menu. If this version is anything like it, you'll love it. I'm going to take your word for it. He half turned to watch the children at the other table who were busy coloring and playing tic-tac-toe. How is your grandmother? Claire asked. She'd worried that the concert and dinner last night had been a bit much for the older woman. She's good. She was down in the bakery before me this morning. Oh, and before I forget, she wants your mother's stew recipe. Aiden grabbed a breadstick. I'll text it to you tonight, Claire promised. Ready to explain why you didn't want to go on an actual date? Aiden asked. Claire got the feeling he was a little hurt that she dwarfed his big plans for the evening. I have an early flight to New York City tomorrow. She held her breath, anxious to see how he'd take the news. Is this about the job offer? he asked. They asked me to come in for an interview. And it'll give me a chance to pick up a few things from my place. Claire took a sip of her tea. It was ice cold and strong, the way she liked it. That sounds like a good sign. They wouldn't ask you to come in if you didn't have a solid shot at getting the job. Assuming they know you're down here. They know. When does your plane leave? I'll take you to the airport. At six. You'll be busy in the bakery, she said. She knew how early he and his grandmother got up to work on all those baked goods. I can get away for an hour or two. I can be at your place at four. That should give you plenty of time to check in. That's okay. My dad's taking me. I appreciate the offer, though. I didn't think you'd be that eager to get rid of me. Claire smiled, and he returned it. She was glad he realized she'd been teasing him again. Not at all, but this is important to you. How long will you be gone? He tore his breadstick into small pieces before popping one into his mouth absent-mindedly. I fly back tomorrow evening. I should get in around 10 unless there's some sort of weather delay. This was her main concern. Tomorrow was the 22nd of December. If she was stuck in New York for a few days, she'd miss Christmas with her family. I'll pick you up, he said. No argument. It's the least I can do. All right then. Claire sat back when Gabriella returned with their pizzas and two plates. That looks disgusting. Aiden eyed the BLT pizza suspiciously. You are crazy. It looked and smelled amazing. I'm not eating that. To her surprise, the words didn't come out of Aiden's mouth, but out of those of the little boy two tables over. She turned and saw Gabriella setting a dish of spaghetti in front of him. It's spaghetti bolognese, your favorite. His mother's voice was soft and soothing, barely audible over the sound of soft Italian music. It has funny chunks in it, the boy said. That's tomato. I promise it tastes as good as the one at home. Maybe even better. His mother took a bite and nodded approvingly. Claire used her fork to pull a piece of BLT pizza and put it on the plate in front of her before handing it to Aiden. Try it. You'll like it. Aiden opened his mouth to say something. His eyes traveled to the other table. Sure, I'll taste it. It's good to try new things. His voice was a little loud for normal conversation, and the boy turned to look at them. Aiden took a big bite of the pizza and nodded approvingly. What do you think? Claire asked when the boy's attention had turned to his own plate. It's better than I expected. Not my favorite, but not bad. 
What's that white sauce? he asked. Mayo. Claire grinned when she saw his expression. It took him a couple of seconds to recover enough to take another bite. They both dug in, sharing both of the pizzas between them. She noticed Aiden reached for more of the meat lovers, but ended up eating three small slices of the BLT one. So, you think you'll go back to New York? Aiden asked when they'd eaten their fill. I haven't made up my mind. I'll see how the meeting tomorrow goes. Brent will be there. She wasn't looking forward to it, but if she wanted to stay in the publishing house, she'd have to deal with him. Better to get that first awkward post-breakup conversation out of the way and see how he treated her. You'll do great. Aiden washed his last bite down with more tea. I don't have the job yet. How about you? Any plans for the future? Nothing set in stone, but eventually, I'll have to go back to Atlanta. My boss is pushing for me to come back after New Year's. And you're ready to go back, she asked. I'm not going to miss getting up long before dawn, to bake. Aiden's smile was a little sad, but overall, she got the impression he was looking forward to resuming his old life. He'd been here much longer than her, after all. I don't blame you. I'm not looking forward to getting up at three tomorrow. She glanced at her phone. It wasn't late, but she'd have to catch a few hours of sleep soon if she wanted to look fresh for the meeting tomorrow. Let's get out of here then. Aiden asked for the check and insisted on paying. Ten minutes later, they were in his truck, on their way to her parents' house. Good luck tomorrow, Aiden said before leaning over and giving her a quick peck on the cheek when they were stopped. Thanks. Claire hopped out and closed the door behind her. She couldn't shake a feeling of emptiness as she walked into the house. Maybe she should go back to New York. At least she had a job and a purpose there. Chapter 17 New York City was beautiful at Christmas time. Especially if you didn't have to go anywhere. Claire looked out the window of the cab that was taking her to the Manhattan Publishing House, where she'd spent much of her days since moving to the city. Traffic was bad, but with a little luck, she'd make it to the office on time for her meeting with Harold Rice, head of the non-fiction department. In town, to go Christmas shopping? The cab driver asked. Claire shook her head. Work. I have a meeting at 10. Do you think we'll make it? Not a problem. I'll get you there. He stepped on it and started weaving in and out of traffic. As promised, they arrived at the tall building downtown well before the top of the hour. Claire thanked the man with as generous of a tip as she could afford and stepped out of the warm cab into the frosty air. Pulling her coat closer around herself, she walked into the building, only stopping to smooth down her hair and check her makeup. The burst of cold air had done her good, making her look and feel alive. Thank you for coming in, Mr. Rice said when she stepped into the small conference room. She was surprised to find three editors, along with another department head and one of the administrative assistants, in the room. Brent, thankfully, wasn't there. Claire put on her most professional smile, squared her shoulders, and told herself to project confidence. It worked. The interview went well, and Mr. Rice seemed pleased with her answers. The other editors nodded approvingly at several of her answers to questions about how she would organize a certain launch or approach a client. The door to the conference room opened, and Brent walked in. Sorry, I'm late. I got held up on a phone call. Writers. He shook his head. One of the other editors in the room laughed. They'd all been there, spending a good hour arguing about corrections or whether a book tour was necessary. Come on in. I wanted you here because I've been hearing rumors that the two of you are in a relationship, and I want to make sure that's not going to be a problem. Should she accept our offer, Claire will no longer be part of your team, but the two of you would continue to work together on projects. As peers. That will not be a problem. Claire is a pleasure to work with. Brent smiled at her like nothing had happened. It made her skin crawl and we are not in a relationship. Claire sat up straighter, her eyes on Mr. Rice. Wonderful. 
Unless Brent has questions for you, I think we're done here. Are you staying in town for the holidays or heading back home? Mr. Rice asked. I'm flying back this afternoon. In that case, safe travels and think about our offer. If you accept, and between me and you, I think you should, you can start your new position January 2nd. Mr. Rice shook her hand before handing her an envelope with the details of the position and benefits he'd offered her. It wasn't a great deal, but a fair one. The salary wasn't as high as she'd hoped, but there was a chance for a raise in six months that would allow her to move into an apartment of her own. I'll walk you out, Brent said, falling into step beside her as they exited the conference room. I need to stop by my desk. Claire stalked off, hoping he'd get the hint. She wasn't so lucky. It's an excellent offer, he said, leaning against her desk. Claire felt his eyes on her as she looked through her desk, tucking a few family photographs in her purse. I know. You're not thinking about turning this down, are you? he asked when she was done. I haven't decided. Claire shrugged into her coat and walked to the elevator. My folks were looking forward to meeting you. As was I, but now that's not going to happen. Her tone was frosty. She did not want to talk about this. Here or anywhere else. I don't leave until tomorrow if you want to change your plans. Brent tried to put an arm around her shoulders. Claire shrugged him off and took a step to the right to create a bit of distance between them. I won't. I'm not going to Colorado with you tomorrow or any time. That ship sailed when I. Fair enough. I hoped you wouldn't be stubborn about this, but if you need time, I get it. But don't let it affect us at work. His tone was friendly, like cheating was no big deal and she was overreacting. I'm not being stubborn. You made your choice, and I made mine. She pushed the button to call the elevator. You're going to decline Harold's offer, aren't you? Brent asked. I haven't decided yet. But you and me, that's over. The door slid open, and Claire stepped into the elevator, pushing the button for the ground floor. You turn this down, you're done, Brent said before the door to the elevator closed. He was probably right, and to her surprise, that thought didn't bother her as much as it would have a week or two ago. Hey, it's you. Renee smiled at her when Claire walked into the diner. It was a relief to see the woman was working again. I left a bag here the other night and was wondering if you had kept it by chance. It was a long shot, but Claire figured it couldn't hurt to stop in and check. She had another hour to kill before she needed to head back to the airport and this was as good a place as any to spend it. Sure do. It looked like a Christmas present. I wasn't sure you'd be back in time to get it. What brings you back to the city? Renee ducked behind the counter and started rummaging around. I had a job interview. A promotion at the place where I work now. Claire leaned over the counter, trying to get a glimpse of what the other woman was doing. Here it is. Renee raised up, the brown paper bag Claire had carried with her when she'd walked in on Brent and Stacy in her hand. She handed it to Claire. Could I get a cup of coffee and a slice of that pie? I have a little time to kill before my flight back. Sure thing. Do you want to sit up at the counter or get a booth? Renee asked, pulling out a cup and pouring coffee. This is fine. Claire hopped up on the bar stool tucking the paper bag and her purse under her feet. Flying back home for Christmas, and then you're back here with us in the city that never sleeps? Renee asked with a smile. I'm not sure. Claire thought about the contract in her purse. It wasn't a bad offer. But being back on Palmer Island made her realize what she'd been missing from her life up here. Family, close friends, a sense of community. Here, she had to hire someone when her sink got clogged. Back home, she could think of a handful of people who would have been happy to help her out, including her dad and Aiden. If he stayed. Well, at least you have the holidays to think it over. Renee put a slice of apple pie in front of her. You remembered. Claire looked up, the small gesture bringing tears to her eyes. Of course. 
You made an impression the other night. Renee winked before walking off to take another patron's order. Claire dug into the pie. It was as good as she'd recalled. Different from the pies back home. This one was tartar, the crust less flaky. It reminded her of a sugar cookie, but not as sweet. How's the pie? Renee asked, refilling Claire's coffee cup before pouring one of her own. As good as last time. And this go-around, she was able to enjoy the sweet treat. I'm glad. My mother bakes them every morning, Renee said. You own the place? Claire asked. She'd assumed the woman was just working here. My family does. We've run this diner since the early 20s. This place has seen things. You should have heard my grandfather talk about the day the stock market crashed. And during 9-11, we kept the place open for first responders. Renee pointed to a row of pictures behind her. Claire hadn't noticed them. There were only a handful, three of them in black and white. All the images looked faded. This place has a history. It sure does. Do you mind if I ask? What's in the bag that was important enough to come back for? Renee asked. You didn't look? Claire was shocked. When the woman shook her head, Claire grabbed the bag and carefully pulled first one, then the other teacup, removing the newspaper wrappings and setting the cups on the counter. They are beautiful. Renee picked one of them up for a closer look. Christmas present, she asked. It is. Not for the person she'd bought them for, but Claire had a feeling the new recipient would appreciate them even more. I'm going to say something, and you can take it or leave it as you see fit. Renee took Claire's empty pie plate. Okay. Claire wrapped the teacups carefully and returned them to the bag while she listened. You're not a New Yorker, honey. Your eyes light up every time you mention home. Unless your job offer is something spectacular, you'd be happier on that island of yours. Chapter 18 Thanks for picking me up. Claire smiled when Aiden pulled up to the arrival area of the small Myrtle Beach airport in his grandmother's car. No problem. Is that all you brought back? Aiden took the small duffel bag she was holding and put it in the trunk. Other than her purse, it was all she had with her. I'm only staying through the holidays, Claire said. In that case, congratulations. Aiden pulled Claire into a fast hug, letting go almost immediately. Best to keep this casual if she'd decided to stay in New York City. Claire raised her eyebrows. For what? For getting the job. I'm assuming that's why you're going right back. Aiden did his best to sound happy and upbeat about it. I got the offer, but haven't accepted yet. I have a few days to make up my mind. Claire walked to the passenger side and got into the car. I hope they are making it worth your while. Aiden fiddled around with the radio until he found a station that played something other than beach music. The volume was low, but it would cut out the need to fill the silence with small talk. They did. If it wasn't exactly what I've wanted since I first moved up north, I wouldn't consider going back. Claire leaned the seat back and used her coat to cover herself. Aiden cranked up the heat. Did you run into your ex? I did. He was part of the meeting. He told me I'd be an idiot to even consider turning the job down. Claire sighed. Are you considering it? The question he wanted to ask was if she could see herself moving back to Palmer Island and giving whatever this was between them a shot. I thought about it. Working with Brent will be awkward. Can you believe the guy thought we could pick up where we left off before I caught him cheating on me? She shook her head and snuggled deeper into her coat. Aiden clenched his jaw, his hands gripping the steering wheel much tighter than he needed to. He wanted to fly up there and punch the guy in the face. At least I had time to stop by my place and grab a few things. I forgot how tiny that studio apartment is. I'm pretty sure my bedroom at home is bigger. She laughed. The sound did much to soothe his soul and temper the anger in his chest. My place in Atlanta isn't big either. About 400 square feet. 
it had been a challenge to furnish it. Thankfully, Ikea wasn't far from his place. Ha, huh, that's a palace, compared to the tiny studio I'm sharing. We got lucky and found something in our price range with a kitchenette. Otherwise, it would have been a dorm fridge with a hot plate on top. Sharing a studio with a roommate can't be easy, Aiden said. There would be no privacy. And if the place was as small as she described, he doubted there was room for two beds. It's been a challenge. Both of us are busy though and work long hours. We mostly come home to crash for a few hours. And there's a ton of stuff to do on the weekends. Museums, parks, shopping, her voice was soft and a little wistful. Maybe she enjoyed living in the city more than he'd realized. Claire grew quiet, her eyes drifting closed when he glanced over at the passenger seat as they rode mile after mile down the dark highway that would take them back to Palmer Island. What are you going to tell them? Aiden asked as he pulled into the driveway of her parents' house. I don't know. Claire unbuckled and hopped out of the car, Aiden following close behind. Here, I'll get it. He opened the trunk and pulled out her bag. Claire held her hand out for it, but he shook his head. The least he could do was to carry it to the door for her. Thanks, but I'm good, Claire said. I'm pretty beat. Can we talk tomorrow? Aiden nodded and watched her walk away. Why the long face this morning? Miss Doris asked the next morning. They were working side by side in the bakery, shaping loaves and taking muffins out to cool. I don't have a long face. Aiden hadn't slept well after dropping Claire off, but other than that, there was nothing wrong. Sure, last night hadn't gone as he'd hoped, but at the end of the day, it didn't really matter. She was going back to New York, and he had to figure out what he wanted to do. Go back to Atlanta for good or quit his job and work in the bakery full time. Yes, you do. And if I had to guess, I'd say it has something to do with Claire flying up to New York. Did she decide to take the job? Miss Doris pulled out another tray of muffins and sat them on the counter to cool for a few minutes. She's not sure yet what she wants to do, Aiden said. Watching the two of you dance around like this is giving me anxiety, his grandmother said. She was busy slicing several loaves of sourdough bread. Aaron, let them work this out on their own. Miss Doris carefully removed the muffins, sitting them on a cooling rack to come to room temperature before they added them to today's baked goods displays. It's taking more patience than I have left in me. The two of you. Aaron. Miss Doris shook her head. I don't think Claire is interested in anything serious. Aiden wasn't sure he was either. There was too much up in the air right now. That's okay. You two will figure things out, Miss Doris said. Aiden, would you mind grabbing another sack of flour from out back? The bell announced a new customer as he walked through the small office into the back storage area. By the time he returned, a 50-pound sack of flour slung over one shoulder, Claire was standing in the shop. Did you get a chance to see Sophie at the bookstore? Miss Doris asked her. Aiden set the sack of flour down, feeling Claire's eyes on him. I did just now. She was on her way out the door. Simon's family has a boat in the holiday boat parade tonight, and they are all busy getting it ready. You know, stringing lights, hanging Christmas decorations all over the vessel. That's wonderful. They haven't done that since Simon and his sister were little. His grandmother smiled at Claire. Aaron, did you decide if you are going to go watch? Miss Doris asked, turning to face his grandmother. I'd love to go, but I can't stay out there until it gets dark. My joints are aching, and the cold weather doesn't help. Why don't we get Aiden and Claire to save us seats? If you don't mind hanging out on the creek for a while, we'll bring coffee and sandwiches after dark, Miss Doris said. That's not a bad idea. I'm sure Brooke would love to bring the kids, but having them out there on the water for hours without someone getting wet would be tough. Let me give her a call. Claire stepped away and pulled out her phone. That wasn't exactly subtle, his grandmother said. But it's working. Miss Doris grinned and got to work on the next batch of muffins. 
maybe it will, maybe it won't. If Aiden realizes that building a life here with Claire is the right path for him, they have a chance. His grandmother put the sliced bread in bags and moved them to a basket in front of the muffin display. I'm right here, Aiden said. Oh, we know. That was a hint. Miss Doris winked and cracked a dozen eggs into the large stainless steel bowl. What was a hint? Claire asked. I was hoping Aiden would take the muffins out before they burn to a crisp, Miss Doris said quickly. It smells a little burned, Claire said. Aiden rushed to the oven, removing three large muffin tins. Thankfully, they weren't burned. It would have set them back a good twenty minutes in their baking schedule if they had. My sister loved the idea of going to the parade. I think my parents are coming as well. Do you think we can reserve a large enough spot? Claire asked. Shouldn't be a problem. We'll throw some old blankets and folding chairs in the back of my truck. I think we have a couple in the back. Aiden turned to go look for them. I have a whole stack of them in the garage if you want to stop by my place. Miss Doris dug into the pocket of the dress she was wearing under the large apron she'd put on when she stepped into the bakery, pulling out a set of keys. She removed one of them, handing it to him. When do you want to head out? Claire asked. How does three o'clock sound? That should be early enough to get a good spot. Aiden had a place in mind, close to the park in the center of the island. Sounds good. Do you mind picking me up? Claire asked. He nodded and rang her up for a loaf of sourdough bread and more snowman cookies. You better get one of your grandfather's wool sweaters and a warm jacket. It'll get cold out by the water. There are some hats and gloves on top of the coat closet too, his grandmother said after Claire left the store. Aiden nodded, looking around to see what he needed to get done in the bakery before heading out. Chapter 19 Ready to go? Aiden asked when he pulled up to her parents' house later that afternoon. The truck bed was already full of chairs, a stack of blankets sitting in the back seat. Do we need more chairs? Claire asked. Her dad was rummaging through the garage, looking for camping chairs he swore they still owned. I think we're good. I have about twenty loaded in the truck. He grinned and hopped out of the truck. Hey, Dad. We're good on chairs. I'll see you at the parade later, she called over her shoulder. Her father said something in return before the sound of things falling and muttered curses made their way out of the open garage door. Should we go help him? Aiden asked, turning toward the noise. No. He's going to be in a bad mood because he couldn't find those chairs. I'm pretty sure my mom tossed them years ago. We're better off getting out of here. Claire opened the passenger door and climbed in, setting the small bag she'd packed between her feet. Are you sure? That sounded like he could use a hand. Aiden took a step in the direction of the garage. Yes, I'm sure. Trust me. Her father would be fine, provided they gave him space and time to cool off. All right then. Ready to go? Aiden closed her door when she nodded and jumped into the truck. It took less than ten minutes to get to the small park and boat landing at the center of the island. The parade was set to travel the intercoastal waterway from one end of the island to the other. This will be perfect. Claire hopped out and looked around. It had been a while since she's been here, but as kids, they used to love to swim across to the mainland and back. A few other families were setting up at the park, but there was plenty of space left to choose a good spot. How about right here? Aiden asked. He'd walked to a grassy spot close to the water. It was far enough away from trees to avoid shade but sheltered from the slight breeze that came off the ocean by a row of bushes behind them. Most importantly, it had a clear view of a large stretch of the waterway. Perfect. She set her bag down and helped Aiden carry and set up the chairs they'd brought. By the time they were done, it looked like they were ready for a small theater performance, with the chairs lined up in a half circle around a spread out blanket. This took a lot less time than I figured. Aiden glanced at his watch. 
They had several hours to kill before the rest of their families and Miss Doris would arrive. I brought coffee and a deck of cards. Claire sat down and pulled the old deck from her bag, along with a thermos and two cups. She'd save the snacks and sandwiches for later. So that's what the bag is for. Supplies. Aiden grinned and sat down in the chair next to her. Do you still like playing hearts? she asked. I do, but you can't play it with two people. Yes, you can. Claire quickly flipped through the cards, picking out the threes, fives, sevens, nines, jacks, and kings, before dealing each of them thirteen cards. What are the rules? Aiden asked. They are the same. Wanna play to fifty or one hundred? she asked. They'd played cards with friends and family a lot growing up. She'd learned the rules of this simplified two-player version one rainy afternoon in New York when she and her roommate were stuck inside and the power went out. 100 works. Looks like I'm going first. He put down the two of clubs and they were off. As they played and they talked about their respective lives, the island, and what it was like to be back here for an extended stretch of time. It's been easier than I thought, Aiden said while shuffling the cards. What do you mean? Claire poured the last of the coffee into their cups. Getting back into the swing of island life and helping around the bakery. At first, I hated getting up that early, but it's got its advantages. The world is quiet. Or at least the island is. I get to spend time with my grandma. In the summer, We'd get the first few batches of dough started and then ride out to the beach to watch the sun come up before firing up the ovens. He smiled, longing in his voice and his eyes. Claire sat up. Do you like it enough to stay here? I'm thinking about it. How about you? Have you made up your mind about the job offer? His eyes were on her, his gaze intense. Did he want her to turn it down? There you two are. We were wondering if we misunderstood the directions you sent. Her parents walked up to them, followed closely by Brooke, Matt, and the kids. Miss Doris and Miss Aaron weren't far behind them. Claire breathed a silent sigh of relief. While there was much that was pulling her back home to Palmer Island, she wasn't sure she was ready to give up her dream. But if he stayed, that might weigh the scales in favor of home. He loved his grandma and he liked Miss Doris and Claire's family, but they couldn't have shown up at a worse time. Claire was finally opening up about her trip to New York. If they'd arrived a few minutes later, he was sure he could have gotten her to talk about what she wanted out of the future and more importantly where she wanted to end up. I brought some coffee. You look like you could use it, Aiden. I don't think I've ever seen you with dark circles under your eyes. Miss Doris set a fresh thermos of coffee down. It looked like it held at least a gallon. And there's hot chocolate. And snowman cookies. His grandmother put down her old picnic basket. It was filled to the top with baked goods, sandwiches, and a second thermos that he recognized from fishing trips with his grandfather. I want some. Evan ran up, holding out both hands. His older sister was close behind. That's not how we ask for things, Brooke said. Her voice was firm, but it did little good when everyone around was smiling at the eager expressions on the kids' faces. May we have some snowman cookies, please? Ava asked. Of course. His grandmother had both of them settled with cookies and cocoa by the time Miss Doris handed him another cup of coffee. At this rate, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep until it was time to get up and bake. At least they'd be closed on Christmas Day and for a few days after. Penny for your thoughts, his grandmother said when she took her seat beside him. He shook his head before tucking a blanket around her to make sure she stayed warm. This wasn't the time or the place to tell her about the realization he had when he woke up in the middle of the night. Look, guys. The first boats are coming. Matt rose and motioned for his children to come with him. They walked closer to the water for a better view. The rest of their group enjoyed the parade from their seats, snacks, and warm drinks at hand. 
Simon and his dad did a great job, Miss Doris said when the Johnson boat made its way past them. It was covered from bow to stern in icicle lights, an igloo, and a snowman sitting on the deck of the small yacht. That looks amazing. I wonder what those are made of. Claire was leaning forward, eyes glued on the boat. Styrofoam, maybe, her father guessed. Simon and Sophie waved when they saw them. Simon threw what looked like snowballs in the kids' direction. Each of them caught two of the white balls and came running up to show them to their mother and grandparents. We got snowballs. Eva called before she reached them. Snowballs, Evan echoed and threw one in Aiden's direction. He caught the small fuzzy ball. From a distance, it looked like a snowball. In reality, it was soft and fuzzy. He tossed it to Claire, who caught it with a grin before returning the treasure to her nephew. Snowball fight. Evan yelled into Aiden's ear before throwing both of his balls at his grandfather, scoring two solid hits. Oh no, not out there. We can have a snowball fight when we get home. Brooke stood, holding her hand out for the balls until both her offspring convinced her they'd hold the fuzzy balls until they got home. A few minutes later, a boat with bright lights, loud Christmas music, and elves throwing candy got their attention, and the snowballs lay forgotten on the blanket. Only in the South do we have to come up with fuzzy snowballs and plastic ice skating rings, Claire said, bouncing one of the balls in her hand. You miss the snow and ice? Miss Doris asked, looking surprised. Most of the time, I don't, but at Christmas time it's nice. Especially if you don't have to go anywhere. Claire grabbed a blanket and snuggled under it like the thought of New York winter weather was making her feel cold. They could go up north for Christmas. Or maybe right after, if snow made her happy. The thought surprised Aiden. Here he was making plans for them before he knew what hers were. He shook his head and forced his eyes back to the parade of boats. Half an hour later, when the kids were getting restless and everyone looked cold and tired, the last of them made it down the waterway. It was the largest of the boats, a full-sized yacht with Santa at the helm. A blow-up version of Rudolph was standing in the bow, complete with a lit-up red nose. Mrs. Santa was throwing candy canes with all her might. Thankfully, most of them landed on the shore. Evan raced after one before his father could get a hold of him. The water wasn't deep, but the boy ended up with wet shoes and pants before Matt could get to him. Evan proudly held a wet candy cane. We're heading back to the house, Brooke said, wrapping the child in a towel she'd brought. Everyone else was ready to leave and between them, it didn't take long to load the chairs and blankets in the truck. Remind me not to have boys, Claire said, watching her sister carry off a screaming Evan. He was the only one of their group not ready to leave, no matter how often they told him that the parade was over. No boys, got it. How do you feel about daughters? Aiden asked. Love them. Claire swung Ava's hand high, making the girl giggle. Good to know. Call me and let me know you got home okay. It was an excuse to talk to her without nosy people around them. I will. She waved before rushing off to catch up with her family, Ava, beside her. You two make a cute couple, Miss Doris said, a bag and her purse slung across her arms. The woman's Oldsmobile was parked not far from his truck. We'll see, he said before helping his grandmother into his truck. They pulled out of the parking lot behind Miss Doris. She means well, his grandmother said. I know. But sometimes it doesn't help to have everyone meddle in our personal business. Hmm. What, he asked. I like that you think there's personal business. Claire is good for you. She makes you happy. And I enjoy seeing the two of you together. His grandmother patted his knee. And she was right. Claire did make him happy. The only question was, did he make her happy, too? Enough to make her give up on New York? Chapter 20 What are you doing in here so late, her mother asked when she found Claire in the kitchen well after dinner. I need to think. I thought I'd make some fudge while I was at it. We're almost out. 
Claire poured a bag of chocolate chips into a glass bowl, slowly melting them over a pot of simmering water. Do you want to talk about it, or do you want space? Her mother asked. There isn't much to talk about. I need to decide if I want to go back to New York and take the job or stay here and, Claire turned to look for the rest of her ingredients. And see how things go with Aiden? Her mother picked up the silicone spatula and stirred the melting chocolate. That's part of it. A big part, but it wasn't the only reason she was considering moving back south. What's the other part? And added the sweetened condensed milk, Claire handed her. Figure out what I could do down here. It's been nice to spend time with everyone. I didn't realize how much I missed living here. Claire smiled when she saw the joy on her mother's face. The offer looks solid, and it's what you've always wanted. But sometimes those priorities change. They did for me when I had your sister, and then you. And had been a marketing executive for a large bank in Charlotte before she and her husband decided to move to Palmer Island to raise their girls. Do you ever wonder what it would have been like if you stayed? Claire asked. It crosses my mind now and then. But if I had, I would have missed so much of the two of you growing up. And I wouldn't have started my business. Interior design has been more rewarding than I ever imagined. And I don't have to deal with shareholders anymore. Trust me, that alone was worth the switch. Her mother handed her the spatula and started lining a baking dish with wax paper. That's good to know. Claire added the remaining ingredients, the vanilla perfuming the entire kitchen as soon as it hit the warm fudge mixture. One more stir, and it was ready to pour. There is one thing I've learned over the years. Job offers come and go. The chance to find love and build a life doesn't come along all that often. When it does, embrace it and see where it goes. It's much more likely you'll regret letting Aiden get away than the editorial position. But what do I know? This is your life and your decision. All I'm saying is, let your heart have a say in this. Not just that brilliant head of yours. I will. Claire scraped the last of the fudge into the glass dish and popped a lid on it. Good. I know you'll make the right decision. As much as I'd love to have you back for good, we love and support you no matter where you end up. And New York City isn't all that bad. I enjoy the shopping when we come up to visit. Do you mind if I take this to Aiden's? I'll make another batch for us tomorrow. Claire stuck the glass container into the fridge to set up. I never thought it was for us, and said before leaving the kitchen. Hey, I wasn't expecting you tonight, Aiden said when he opened the door. Sorry, is this too late? It sounded like you wanted to talk, and I figured this would be better in person than over the phone. And I brought fudge. Claire held out the glass container. It was still warm. The twenty minutes it had taken her to get ready hadn't been nearly enough time to let it set. Not at all. We're still up. The bakery is closed tomorrow. Come on in. He took the fudge from her and led the way to the kitchen. This should go in the fridge for a bit. Claire leaned against the counter and watched Aiden rummage around the fridge, moving items to make room for the dish. Claire, is that you? Miss Aaron walked into the kitchen and gave Claire a hug. How are you feeling after all the excitement at the parade? Claire asked. The older woman looked tired and a little frilier than she had earlier in the day. Oh, I'm fine. A little tired maybe, but it was well worth it. What smells good? Claire brought fudge. It's in the fridge. Aiden pointed to the cream-colored appliance that looked like it had been part of the kitchen since the 60s. I just made it. It's still warm. I'm sure it will be delicious. I'm heading to my bedroom. There's a Christmas movie I want to watch. Call me when the fudge is ready. Miss Aaron left the room and made her way down the hall. A few minutes later, Claire heard the TV coming on, the volume higher than she'd expected. I didn't realize your grandmother was hard of hearing. What does she do? Read lips? Claire looked up when Aiden chuckled. No, she can hear fine. 
I think she's trying to give us a little privacy without leaving the place. Okay then. I guess there are some things we should talk about. It's kind of why I came over. The fudge is more of a bribe. That sounds serious. Do you want to go sit in the living room? Aiden asked. He led the way into the cozy room next door that held a small sofa and two chairs. A small coffee table that held candles and magazines sat in the center of the room. The TV was on, the sound silenced. Aiden turned it off. You don't have to do that on my account, Claire said. You said you wanted to talk. This can wait. Aiden took a seat on the couch, motioning for her to sit next to him. Wasn't that a basketball game? Claire asked, amused and surprised he'd turn off a game. It was, but you know what I mean. I can catch the score and recap later. He leaned forward and took her hand in his. You're not making this easy. I'm trying to gather my thoughts here. A nervous giggle escaped her mouth. Why was this so hard? She suddenly felt like a teenager, asking the boy she liked on a date. Now you're really making me nervous. Spit it out, woman. What's on your mind? I'm trying to make a decision about New York and there's one variable I can't quite figure out, she said, biting her lip. What variable is that, he asked, squeezing her hands. You. Or rather, whatever this is between you and me. She held her breath, her eyes scanning his face for any sign of a reaction. I'm a variable? he asked, a smile playing around his lips. It belied the concern in his eyes. I could be way off base here, and if so, I'm sorry. I like spending time with you. I like being around you, talking to you, going to the arcade with you. I was wondering if this was something you'd like to explore further. See where this goes. Her eyes were drawn to his Adam's apple when he swallowed hard. He didn't say a word, just sat there, staring at her, her hand still in his. If I read this wrong, no hard feelings. I should probably take the job, anyway. I might regret it if I don't. New York isn't so bad and who knows how much I'll actually work with Brent, she pulled her hands from his and rose. Don't. He pulled her back down to the couch. I should probably go, she said, warmth flowing into her cheeks. No, you shouldn't. And no, you didn't read this wrong. I would like to see where this goes too. Aiden took her hands in his again. They felt warm and comforting, grounding her somehow, despite the tornado that was raging in her heart and mind. Does that mean you're considering staying here on Palmer Island? she asked. I'm thinking about it. And not just because of us. I like it here and don't tell her I said this but it looks like my grandmother will need help for quite a while. Sticking around wouldn't be the worst thing. Would you quit your job in Atlanta? I might not have to. My boss made it pretty clear that I either get back there permanently at the first of the year, or they'll replace me. Aiden shrugged, but it was easy to see that it was bothering him. There's no one else who could help her for a while? Claire asked, squeezing his hands. I thought you wanted me to stay here. Aiden smiled, but it was tinged with sadness or regret. I do, but only if it's what you want to. Why do these decisions have to be so hard? Stuff was a lot easier when we were in high school. She blew out her breath. Not really. Deciding to do what my dad thought best wasn't easy. The last thing I wanted to do back then was to break things off with you. But he thought it would make the difference between getting a full ride or not. He was probably right. You played a lot better after we split. Maybe I was a distraction. It had hurt to see him become the star of the team, winning the state championship. Practice was the only time I didn't think about you. I practiced a lot, trying to get you out of my mind. Did it work? she asked. Not really. I'd still rather talk to you than play or watch basketball. He pulled her closer, and Claire's eyes drifted closed. Chapter 21 Claire's face was less than an inch away from his. He could feel her sweet breath washing over his face. 
her eyes were closed. Every fiber of his being screamed to get closer, to feel her soft lips, to lose himself in another kiss. He hesitated. This kiss would mean something. It was a commitment to give this a try. To start a serious relationship. Aiden wasn't sure he was ready for that. Too much in his life was up in the air. Everything okay? Claire's eyes fluttered open. Yeah, how about some music to drown out whatever movie my grandmother is playing back there? It's a little distracting. He jumped up and strode over to the old stereo, sitting on a credenza on the far wall of the living room. He fiddled with the buttons until he found a station that didn't play Christmas music. Soft rock? Claire's eyebrows rose, a small smile, playing around her lips. I could say, I'm feeling a little nostalgic. Soft rock was my secret weapon in high school, but to be honest, I was looking for anything other than Christmas music. He walked over to the couch and held out his hand. He may not be ready to seal their fate with a kiss, but he could at least hold her close and slow dance to the music they'd enjoyed when they'd first started dating. She took his hand and let him pull her up and close to him. There wasn't much room to move with all the furniture in the small space, but that hadn't stopped them as teens, and it wouldn't now. This is nice. Claire's body softened, molding into his as he pulled her closer and the two of them moved in the small two-foot square space between the couch and the bookshelf. It is. He smelled the peach scent of her shampoo and closed his eyes, losing himself in the feeling of having her close. He could see this working. Could see himself dancing with her at their wedding, seeing her heavy with child, and finally twirling her through the kitchen to the same song many years from now, both of them gray. He could see an eternity stretching out before them if they took the jump together. He swallowed hard. And now, for a little holiday cheer. One hour of uninterrupted holiday classics, starting with All I Want for Christmas, by Mariah Carey. Claire laughed. We can't escape it. Might as well embrace it. She pulled him closer, swaying to the song. Sounds like a plan. He steered her to the center of the room, where the little sprig of mistletoe his grandmother had bought at the fair hung suspended from a lamp. Maybe there was something to all this talk of holiday magic. Look up, he whispered into her ear. He kissed the soft spot under her ear, his lips, traveling down the side of her face, to the corner of her mouth. Mistletoe. Her voice was smoky and soft, the word barely a whisper. Mistletoe, he echoed before his lips, brushed across hers. Her hands left his shoulders and moved to cradle his head. Her fingers ran through his hair and pulled him closer, begging him to deepen their kiss. Aiden was happy to oblige. He lost himself in the feeling of her. Surrounded by her scent, the warmth of her body, and the taste of her mouth. This was home. This was where he belonged. Nothing mattered except the two of them. Together. What was that? Claire asked in a daze. That kiss had been something else. Something she didn't want to end. Or at the very least, something she wouldn't mind repeating. Again and again. What was what? Aiden asked. His lips were brushing against hers, teasing, questioning. Ready for another kiss. That bumpy noise. Claire took a small step back, creating a bit of distance between them. She needed to think. The noise meant something, and it was important. Aiden's head flew up, his eyes alert. From down the hall? She nodded and watched him rush down the hall. The door to his grandmother's room flew open, the sound of the TV suddenly twice as loud. Grandma? Aiden said. Claire turned the radio off and wondered if she should join him. Grandma. Aiden's voice was louder, more urgent. Claire walked down the hall to check on them. The sound of the TV ceased. Grandma, wake up. Aiden's voice was frantic by the time Claire reached the door to the older woman's bedroom. Everything okay, she asked, sticking her head in. Miss Aaron lay on the floor, her face pale, her hands clutched to her chest. Her lips were turning blue. No. 
Call 911, Aiden barked before kneeling down, his ear pressed to her chest. Claire doubled back to the living room. Her purse was next to the couch where she'd sat it down. She dug through it, her hands shaking until she felt the familiar cool metal shape of her cell phone. Hurry! Aiden called. She dialed and ran back down the hall to join them. 911, what's your emergency? We need an ambulance at 27 Main Street on Palmer Island. The apartment above the bakery. Miss Aaron is unconscious. Claire's voice shook, her brain racing to decide how to convey information as quickly as possible. Is she breathing? The operator asked. Claire repeated the question to Aiden. Barely. Her breathing is very shallow, and her color isn't good. It's her heart, Aiden yelled toward her phone. His hand was on his grandmother's chest, the other holding her hand. I heard. An ambulance is on its way, and I'm staying on the line with you until they get there. Okay. Aiden, the ambulance will be here soon. She crouched down to the floor and set the phone on speaker. Tell me what's going on. You mentioned her color isn't good, and she has a heart condition. The woman was calm and professional. Yes. She had a heart attack this summer. She's very pale, and her lips are turning blue. Aiden relayed what medication his grandmother was on and who her primary care physician and cardiologist were. I will alert both of them. The ambulance is ten minutes out. Claire prayed they would make it in time. Chapter 22 How is her breathing? Claire asked. Maybe a little stronger? He hated how unsure his voice sounded. Seeing his grandmother on the floor, struggling to breathe, clutching her chest was painful. Almost more than he could handle. He couldn't lose her. Not like this. Not right before Christmas. How would he tell his father? That's good. I'm sure they'll be here any minute. Claire sat down next to him and his grandmother. She put an arm around him. It was comforting, but also a reminder of how badly he'd messed up. He should have noticed she wasn't feeling well. Should have questioned her about going to her bedroom early. The 911 operator was busy typing away, giving them the occasional update on the ambulance, and making sure his grandmother was doing okay. Would you mind going downstairs and waiting for the paramedics? It might save some time if you can show them where to go? Aiden asked. Having Claire this close to him was hard. On the one hand, he wanted her here, by his side. She kept him grounded and gave him more strength than she realized. On the other hand, she was the distraction that had caused this. He'd been lost in kissing Claire while his grandma's heart stuttered and made her lose consciousness. She could have died. Of course. Claire jumped up. A few seconds later, he heard the door to the apartment open. Cold air streamed down the hallway and into the bedroom. It helped clear his head. Aiden rose and grabbed a pillow and blanket off the bed. He covered the old woman who had helped raise him with the throw. Then, he hesitated. Would it be okay to put a pillow under her head? He asked the operator. You said she fell, right? Let's not move her until the paramedics get there and have a chance to check her out. Aiden nodded. He should have known better to ask if he should put a pillow under her head. Yes, ma'am. I covered her with a blanket. He felt helpless. He wanted to fix this, turn back time. Tell Claire that tonight wasn't a good time to talk. That's great. We want her warm and comfortable. Can you take her pulse for me? The woman asked. Aiden wasn't sure if the task was to keep him busy, or if there was more to it, but it felt good to be able to do something, anything, while they waited. He grabbed his grandmother's wrist and searched for her pulse. Looking at his watch, he counted. Time had slowed to a crawl. Seconds stretched into minutes and more as he counted one heartbeat after the next. Her heart was fast and a little irregular, driving his anxiety to new heights. Shouldn't the paramedics be here by now? At the very least, he'd expected to hear sirens in the distance. 
He reported his findings to the 911 operator. Okay, good. And still no trouble breathing? None at all. She seems to be doing a little better. Her color is coming back, he said, wishing he was as sure as he sounded. Aiden? What happened? His grandmother's voice was faint and crackling. She opened her eyes and looked around the bedroom. You fell. I found you here, unconscious. The ambulance is on its way to take you to the hospital. There's no need to make a fuss, she tried to sit up. Aiden put a hand on her shoulder. Don't move. I'm not making a fuss. This is serious, and I need you to stay still until the paramedics can check you out. I'm fine. I got a little dizzy, that's all. I'll call Dr. Martin in the morning. She was getting agitated, her hands moving around, grasping for anything to hold on to. Aiden took them both in his. Mrs. Caldwell? This is Jenny. I need you to listen to your grandson. Help is on the way, and they'll make sure you're okay. Jenny. That's very kind of you, but you can call them back. I'm sure they have better things to do than to baby an old woman with a dizzy spell. It happens all the time. Why didn't you say something? I would have made an appointment with your cardiologist, and we could have avoided all this. His grandmother shook her head. Down this hallway, the second door on the right, Claire said. A heartbeat later, two paramedics carrying bags came into the small bedroom. Aiden rose and stepped to the side to give them room to work. Mrs. Caldwell? How are you feeling? One of them asked. I'm fine. How many times do I have to say it before someone listens to me? Her voice was getting stronger. These numbers say otherwise. The young man looked at the small device he'd clipped to his grandmother's finger. Your oxygen levels are low. Let's get you hooked up to something that will help you breathe. Why don't we give these guys a little room to work? We can stand out here in the hallway. Claire took his hand and led him out of the room. Aiden leaned against the wall opposite the door and slid down, his legs no longer capable of holding him upright. We shouldn't have. I shouldn't have. If I wasn't so distracted, I would have noticed that something was wrong. I know. If we'd insisted she stay with us. I thought she was tired from a long day. Claire sat down next to him and squeezed his hand. She was. And she wanted to give us a little space to talk. Aiden sighed and put his arm around Claire. He needed to have her close, feel her warmth. Just for tonight. Tomorrow, he'd tell her to take the job in New York. Then he'd call his boss and quit his job. There was no way he was leaving his grandmother. Not when something like this could happen at any moment. He'd watch her closely from now on. Without distraction. And he'd get her to eat healthier and insist on daily walks. He made a mental list of everything they could do to reduce her stress and the amount of time she spent in the bakery. Miss Aaron is strong. She'll pull through. Claire put her head on his shoulder. He would miss this. Aiden closed his eyes and burned the feel of Claire in his arms into his memory. I'm glad you're here, he whispered. They sat quietly while the paramedics worked, checking vitals, taking his grandmother's blood pressure, and whatever else it was they did to make sure she was in no imminent danger. She's stable enough to transport. Does one of you want to ride in the ambulance with us? The older of the two paramedics asked when he stepped out of the room. I will. Aiden jumped up. I can follow in your truck if you'd like. Claire got up as well, making room as the paramedic started wheeling his grandmother through the apartment and out the door. That'd be great. He grabbed his phone and his keys from the credenza. Jackets, Claire said, grabbing hers and her purse before handing him the fleece he'd left hanging on the back of the kitchen chair. I'm so sorry I ruined your evening, his grandmother said when he stepped up next to her. Is there anything you want us to pack for you? Claire asked. My pocketbook. I'm not sure what else. I hope I won't be there long. His grandmother smiled at Claire. 
I can come back and get whatever you need after the doctors have had a chance to look you over, he said. I'm sure this is nothing. A big waste of resources. What if someone else needs an ambulance right now, his grandmother asked. We have several. And it's a good thing your grandson called us. You are not well, Mrs. Caldwell. Your heart could give you trouble any second. Why do you think we're keeping this defibrillator close by? The paramedic's tone was friendly, but firm. They wouldn't take you if they didn't think it was necessary. Aiden waited while the paramedics carried his grandmother down the stairs and out onto the sidewalk. He and Claire followed the paramedics out the door. Aiden locked up and made his way to the ambulance, wondering when they'd make it back home. Chapter 23 I'm sure we'll hear something soon. Claire squeezed Aiden's hand after getting off the phone with her mom. She didn't want her parents to worry about where she was this late at night. The hospital waiting room was sparsely furnished. Drab brown fabric covered the chair, clashing with the gray linoleum floor. A few magazines lay on the metal tables. The only nod to the holidays was a small tree strung with lights that sat in the corner. A lone golden star sat at the top of the tree. I hope so. We've been here for what? An hour already? Aiden rose and paced back and forth along the far side of the room. His head turned in the direction of the glass door every time someone in a white coat walked by. Can I get you anything? Coffee? Food? Claire asked, her eyes following him as he moved across the room. Aiden shook his head. I'm fine. The set of his shoulders told a different story, as did his furrowed brow. Let me know if you change your mind. I think I saw a coffee machine down the hall, and there has to be some sort of cafeteria in this hospital. It was getting late, but the place might still be open. Thanks. I don't think I could keep anything down, and the last thing I need is coffee. I have plenty of adrenaline coursing through my system. Aiden smiled wryly. It's been an exciting evening, Claire said. That it has. Probably not what you imagined doing tonight. He was right. This wasn't how she imagined things would go. It had started out well, and that kiss had been something else. She would remember it for the rest of her days. Not quite, she said. Aiden's phone rang. He pulled it out of his pocket and glanced at the number before silencing it and shoving the phone back into his pocket. Something important, she asked. Work. Nothing that can't wait. Aiden sat down next to her and picked up a magazine. He flipped through it quickly. She didn't think a single thing on the pages registered. She got it though. It gave his hand something to do. Anything was better than sitting still and continuing to wait for news on his grandmother. The phone rang again. The third time Aiden answered. What? He rose and walked to the far corner of the room. I'm sorry, man. I can't help you right now. I'm at the hospital. His voice was professional, but it was hard to ignore the inpatient undertone. Aiden went quiet for a while. Claire heard the low hum of conversation on the other end. Go back to some of the meal plans we went over last month. You can recycle those indefinitely. I'll check in with you in the next day or two. And don't try to do too much. Slow is fast when it comes to rehab. He paced along the far side of the room. I'm fine. My grandmother isn't. I've got to go. His head shot up when someone walked up to the door. The person turned and made their way down the hallway without stopping. What can I do for you? she asked. He looked beyond stressed after the call. Nothing. Unless you can turn back time. His phone went back into his pocket. Why don't you silence that and let me help you calm down for a few minutes? You're familiar with breathing exercises? Claire turned to face him and held her hands out for his. I am, but I'm in no frame of mind to meditate. Aiden sat down next to her, but didn't take her hands. Humor me. Give me your hands. Claire reached over and took his and hers. 
When he didn't pull away, she proceeded. Focusing on slowing her own breathing, she directed him to breathe in for four, hold for four, and then release the air for four counts. Box breathing had helped her through many anxiety attacks and stressful meetings. She hoped it would help Aiden as well. One more time, she said, going through the count one last time. His eyes had drifted closed at some point during the exercise. His facial expression softened, and the tension in his shoulders was gone. Thank you. That helped more than I thought, he said when they were done. Claire felt calmer and more centered herself. And she wasn't under anywhere near the stress and pressure he had to be under between his job, the bakery, his grandmother, and now this setback. I'm glad. Let me know if you want to go again. She released his hands, missing the connection with him instantly. Mr. Caldwell? The door to the waiting room opened an hour later, and a man in a white coat, a stereoscope slung around his neck, walked in. Yes. How is she? Aiden jumped up and closed the distance between him and the doctor. She's fine. We ran a series of tests. Her heart is weak, but she'll pull through. With some rest and adjusted medication, I expect her to make a full recovery. We are going to keep her overnight for observation. She's in her room and asking for you. Of course. Where is she? Aiden was halfway out the door, before turning and holding his hand out for her. Aiden hesitated to open the door to the room where his grandmother was recovering. She had to be exhausted. He was worried about waking her, and honestly, he was scared to see what shape she was in after all the poking and prodding she'd likely undergone in the past hour or two. Everything okay? Claire was next to him, her hand still in his. Yes. I just needed a minute. Aiden knocked softly and opened the door an inch or two. There you are. Come in. His grandmother laid in bed, a pillow propping her up slightly. She was hooked up to a monitor and in four. How are you feeling? Aiden asked, stepping up to the bed and taking her free hand in both of his. Fine. Tired. And a little hungry. The nurse promised to bring me a snack now that they are done sticking me and scanning me. His grandmother shook her head. Claire pulled a chair up to the side of the bed. Here, sit, she said before going to take a seat in the second one. Claire, I'm so glad you're here to keep Aiden company. Her smile was genuine, and to his relief, there was no hint of pain in them. That was something. Not much, but he would take any good news he could get and I'm glad you're looking better. Are you in pain? Claire asked. No, I'm comfortable. A little drowsy and a little tired, but comfortable. I'm not sure what's in this for, but whatever it is, I need to get some to go. You must be feeling better if you're back to cracking jokes, Aiden said. I am. If I wasn't so tired, I'd get you to break me out of here. My bed is a lot more comfortable than this metal monster. And these pillows? Someone really should require hospitals to get decent pillows. People need their rest when they're sick. She shook her head and pulled on the one behind her head. Here, let me help. Aiden put his hand behind his grandmother's neck and lifted her enough to pull the pillow. He shook it out and folded it in half before tucking it back behind her frail shoulders. That's better. I'll ask the nurses for another pillow to help you sleep tonight. He glanced at his watch. It was later than he'd realized. Almost one o'clock in the morning. No wonder his grandmother looked tired. As did Claire. She was trying to hide it but didn't fool him. Her eyes were drooping and she tried to hide a yawn. It's late. You should go get some rest, his grandmother said. I'm staying with you, Aiden said. Nothing short of a direct order by a professional would keep him from staying by his grandmother's side until she was released. If something happened through the night, he wanted to be there to do what he could. Don't be silly. You're both exhausted. There are plenty of doctors and nurses to take care of me here. And there's nowhere for you to sleep. 
I'm staying, he said, hoping his tone was conveying that there would be no sense arguing about this. Claire, you should go home and get some rest. There's no need for both of us to stay. It was the opposite of what he wanted to say. It was nice to have her here, and her quiet support had meant more than he could convey. Tonight had been scary. It still was. Going through it alone would have been much worse. Are you sure? I could stick around and run back to the apartment if you need something. Claire sat up in her chair. We're fine. I can't think of anything we'd need. Go home. You have got to be exhausted, and I'm sure your family is worried. She had called them earlier, but if her mother was anything like his grandmother, she'd be waiting up for her daughter. If you're sure, Claire rose, but hesitated, standing in the middle of the room. I'm sure. Thank you for being here. Aiden pulled her into a tight hug, holding on a little longer than necessary. He had to force himself to step away and insist she leave. Every fiber of his being screamed for him to hold her close, and watching her walk out the door was hard. But his grandmother was right. She needed sleep. And he needed to find a way to distance himself from her. It wasn't fair to drag her into his family drama. It would take time to get his grandmother back on her feet, and there was no way she could live by herself. He loved Claire too much to tie her to years of caring for his grandmother. Not when her dream job was waiting for her in New York. Good night. She turned and waved before pulling the door closed behind herself. Chapter 24 Good night. Claire waved and stepped into the hallway, closing the door behind herself. The long corridor was empty this late at night. A single nurse sat at the station, working through a stack of paperwork. Claire was in a daze from the events of the day and the evening. Had it really been only a few hours since they'd sat at the edge of the water, watching a parade of decorated boats go by? Heading home, the nurse asked when Claire passed her desk. Yes, getting some sleep. Claire stopped and turned to face the nurse. Good. Mrs. Caldwell seems to be out of the woods. We'll call you if anything changes. Claire was too tired to explain that she wasn't a next of kin and wouldn't get a call. Or that Aiden was staying. She'd text him once she got home and ask him to call her if Miss Aaron's condition took a turn for the worse through the night. She'd be back in a few hours to check on them. Maybe she could grab some coffee and breakfast on her way back to the hospital. Good night, the nurse said before returning to her paperwork. Claire hadn't realized she was still standing at the nurse's station, deep in thought. Good night. She walked to the bank of elevators and pressed the call button. To her surprise, the door to her right opened right away. She got on and pushed the button for the ground floor. Claire leaned against the bar on the side of the elevator, looking at herself in the mirror that covered the entire back wall. She was a mess. Dark circles under her eyes, her hair windblown and messy. She used her fingers to comb through it before pushing it back and tucking it behind her ears. She rubbed her face, trying to wake up enough to make her way to her parents' house and crawl into bed. Maybe Aiden's advice to go home and get some sleep wasn't the worst idea. The door to the elevator opened and a woman in colorful scrubs, a large handbag slung over her shoulder, stepped in. Her right shoulder was covered in a light-colored stain and the scent of spoiled milk came off her. It wasn't overpowering, but it was there. Heading home, the woman asked. Yes. Claire noticed her sensible white sneakers and the yawn the woman tried to hide. Me too. I can't wait to get a shower and a good ten hours of sleep. Her smile was as tired as Claire felt. Long day? Claire asked. The woman nodded. How about you? Loved one sick or hurt? The question threw her. Was Miss Aaron a loved one? She wasn't family, and Claire had always liked the older woman. But love? Maybe. Aiden loved his grandmother, and she loved him. It had been hard to see him in so much pain, feeling helpless to do anything for Miss Aaron. My boyfriend's grandmother was admitted. We found her unconscious. It's her heart. 
I'm sorry. How is she? The woman asked. Improving. Aiden is staying with her. Claire wondered if the woman was a doctor or a nurse. That's good. It's nice to have someone there to advocate for you. And do the little things we don't always get around to right away. The woman leaned against the opposite wall and closed her eyes as they continued their way to the ground floor. Are you a nurse? Claire asked. I am. In the neonatal ward. Thus the spit up. She pointed to the stain on her shoulder. It explained the smell. That sounds like an interesting job. Holding newborn babies sounded infinitely better than changing bandages and dealing with patients in pain. It has its moments. The woman smiled wryly. Claire got the feeling this wasn't one of the better days. I hope your boyfriend's grandmother pulls through, she said when she stepped out of the elevator. Boyfriend. Claire knew she'd used the term first. It had been the easiest way to explain her relationship to Aiden to a stranger. Hearing someone else say it was a different story. It made her realize that she did think of Aiden as her boyfriend. They hadn't had a chance to talk about their relationship, but after that kiss, how could either of them doubt they belonged together? She loved the guy and wasn't sure she ever stopped caring for him. She loved Aiden. And he needed to know that. They could figure out logistics later. What mattered was that they belonged together. In a flash, Claire could see it. The two of them married, living here on the island, raising a family. It felt right, complete. Claire turned to walk back upstairs, to talk to Aiden. She pulled the handle, to the entrance door, she'd left out of a few minutes ago. It was locked. Claire. Claire turned to see who was calling her name. Brent? What are you doing here? Are you going to let her walk away like that? What happened before you found me? Aiden's grandmother asked. He was sitting by her side, her frail hand back in his. I kissed Claire. He was too tired to hide that fact from his grandmother. About time. You two have been dancing around each other for days. She squeezed his hand. You knew? He asked. He thought they had done a good job of hiding their feelings. From themselves and everyone around them. Of course I knew. Why do you think I've been babying my ankle for so long? It gave you and Claire a chance to spend time together. I'm so happy things are working out between the two of you. She reached up and cupped his cheek. I'm not sure it will. She lives in New York. I have to get back to Atlanta. What good is it to dig up old feelings now? He shrugged. Falling in love, or in your case, falling back into love, is never a bad thing. Believe me, when you get to be my age, there are few things you treasure more than the memories of the people you loved. And spending time with those that make the time to stick around for a while. She squeezed his cheek, before moving her hand back into his. I'm glad I came to live with you for a while, Aiden said. Despite how stressful it could be at times, he enjoyed his time with his grandmother. Good. But I'm not going to be around forever, and you need someone to build a life with. I'd feel better if I knew you had Claire by your side. Claire has big plans, and I don't want to stand in the way of them. It wasn't a lie. A half-truth maybe. He did want the best for her. You're afraid to get hurt. She shook her head, looking disappointed. We don't have a future together. We never did. If they had, she wouldn't have given up so easily when he told her they were done. She'd accepted it and moved on, moving away for college, the first chance she got. That's nonsense, and you know it. It was a mistake to break up back then, and I'm not going to let you make it again. It was a gift that the two of you reconnected here on the island. Don't throw that away. She makes you happy. His grandmother pulled her hand away and tucked it under the blanket. That she does. He wasn't sure how he'd gotten through tonight without her by his side the entire time. Watching her walk out that door had been physically painful. Then go after her. Talk to her. Tell her how you feel. If you don't, you'll regret it. 
He rose, not convinced his grandmother was right. But what if she had a point? He felt the keys to his truck in his pocket. Aiden didn't remember when she'd handed them back to him. He pulled them out, looking at the keys, reflecting the light from the lamp over his grandmother's bed. Don't tell me Claire has no way of getting home. The disapproval in his grandmother's voice was thick. She doesn't. He hated the thought of her standing in the cold, waiting for a ride. I raised you better than that. Go. If you don't do anything else, at least drive her home. You're right, he said. It was the least he could do. Any other decisions could wait until tomorrow. Aiden walked out the door and ran down the stairs. Claire had only been gone for a few minutes. With a little luck, he'd catch her before she left the hospital. He didn't stop running until he reached the main entrance. He saw her through the glass door, standing under a bright street light. A man he didn't recognize dressed in a suit and tie stood in front of her. The two of them were talking. Claire's back was turned to him. The man smiled confidently and pulled a small box out of his jacket pocket. Even from this distance, Aiden had no trouble making out what it was when the man opened it. Claire's hand flew to her face. Brent. The guy had to be Brent. Aiden turned and walked to the elevator. He didn't want to stick around and watch the girl he loved accept a proposal from another man. His grandmother had been wrong. Part of him wished he hadn't run after Claire, hadn't allowed himself to hope that the two of them could work out. The other part was glad that there was a clean break. Claire had made her decision. Their kiss had meant nothing. He'd been some kind of backup plan until she worked things out with the guy that could give her everything. New York, her dream job, and the big wedding she'd always wanted. He hesitated before walking back into his grandmother's room. The last thing he wanted was to discuss what he'd witnessed downstairs. But spending the night in the hallway wasn't an option either. He cracked the door open, relieved to see his grandmother sound asleep. Aiden stepped in, carefully closing the door behind him. He walked up to the large picture window that made up one side of the room. He stared out into the dark night that spread out before him. It looked as desolate and lifeless as he felt. Chapter 25 What are you doing here? Claire asked, stunned to see Brent in the parking lot of the hospital on Palmer Island. Your mom said you were here. Everything okay? He stepped closer and stopped less than an arm's length from her. What are you doing here on Palmer Island, Brent? I heard you hadn't accepted the offer yet. I thought maybe it was because of, you know. I'm sorry about that. It won't happen again. I'm here because I want you back. I miss you, Claire. I miss us. It's a little late for that. Claire took a step back. Brent followed her, closing the distance she'd created between them. I'm serious, Claire. We're good together. We make a great team. I want you back. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small velvet-covered box. Her hand flew up to her face. You can't be serious. I told you I am. I want you back. I want us to take the publishing industry by storm. Claire, will you marry me? Brent opened the box. It held a diamond ring in a plain setting. It wasn't a small diamond, but something you could pick up at any jewelry store in the country. No. I won't marry you. And I'm not coming back to New York. At that moment, everything became crystal clear. She didn't want the job. Everything she needed, everything she wanted was right here on Palmer Island. Brent's face fell. You're making a big mistake. I don't think so. Go back to New York. I wish you and Stacy all the best. Claire turned and walked toward the hospital parking lot. It wasn't until she spotted Aiden's truck that she remembered she'd driven it here and given him his keys back earlier in the day. Claire pulled out her phone and called home. Hey, Dad. Yes, Miss Aaron is fine. They are keeping her overnight for observation. Aiden is staying with her. 
Are you coming home? Her father asked. That's the plan. I left the car at the bakery. Any chance you could come pick me up at the hospital? She asked. Already on my way, her father said. Claire turned to make her way back to the entrance of the hospital, hoping Brent had left. To her relief, there was no sign of the man. True to his word, her father showed up five minutes later. That Brent guy showed up at the house tonight. Your mother told him where you were. I told her that was a mistake. He shook his head, pulling away from the hospital and turning toward Main Street and the bakery. It's fine. He found me. She wasn't ready to share everything that had happened tonight. Will he be back? was all her father asked. No. He and I are over. Good. I never liked the guy. Her father slowed down close to her car in the parking lot behind the bakery. You never said anything. Claire unbuckled but stayed in her seat. You sounded happy, and the two of you were so far away. Her father shrugged. Claire got it. He hadn't felt it was his place to tell her whom she should or shouldn't date. Claire reached over and squeezed his hand before opening her door and hopping out. I'll see you at home. I'll follow you, he said. The protective gesture made her smile. It was completely unnecessary, but she appreciated it. It was nice to feel loved and cared for. How are you feeling, Aaron? Miss Doris asked when she walked into the room the next morning, carrying a basket. I'm fine. I don't know why they insisted I spend the night. His grandmother was anxiously waiting for rounds, hoping they'd discharge her. Well, you sound fine. I brought you coffee and a little something for breakfast. Miss Doris unpacked her basket, pulling out cups, a thermos, and several muffins. Why don't we wait on the doctor and make sure all of this is okay? Aiden stepped closer to the bed, reaching for the food. They brought me coffee and food this morning. Well, I'm not sure you could call it coffee. I'm pretty sure the nurse said it was decaf, Aiden said, putting the muffins out of his grandmother's reach. No wonder it tasted like old dishwater. Doris, pour me a cup. His grandmother sat up and held her hand out. Not if it's against doctor's orders. Miss Doris poured a cup of coffee and handed it to Aiden. It smelled amazing. He took a sip and sighed. Thank you. This is not fair. Especially after what my grandson did last night. His grandmother shook her head. What did he do? Miss Doris pulled a chair to the bed and sat down, careful to keep her own cup of coffee out of her friend's reach. He let Claire get away. Worse than that. The poor girl had to find her own way home. His grandmother shook her head. I'm sure Brent took her home after proposing to her. Aiden tried to keep the pain from his voice. By the look of pity from both women, he didn't succeed. Are you sure that's what happened? Miss Doris asked. He nodded. I keep telling him that had to be a misunderstanding. You don't even know what the guy looks like, his grandmother said, turning to look from Miss Doris to him. Aiden shrugged. Who else could it be? I doubt there's someone else out there who would put a ring on her finger out of nowhere. What he couldn't understand was why she'd accepted. The guy had cheated on her. Are you sure she accepted? Miss Doris asked softly. I didn't stick around, but she seemed excited enough to see him. He's seen her hand fly up to her face. He knew the gesture well. It was how every woman in those movies his grandmother loved so much reacted to a proposal, right before whispering yes. You didn't see her leave with him? Miss Doris asked. I didn't. And you didn't walk out there and confront her? Fight for her? Of course not. What did you expect me to do? Throw hands with the guy in the parking lot? Aiden snorted. The idea of punching the guy in the face had its appeal. He wished he'd thought about it at the time. His grandmother shook her head. No. I raised you better than that. What you should have done was walk out there and tell Claire how you feel. 
Miss Doris reached over and grabbed a muffin. What good would that have done, he asked. Have you told Claire how you feel about her, his grandmother asked. Aiden shook his head. No. We don't have a future with her in New York and me here, taking care of you. What happened to moving back to Atlanta, his grandmother asked. I decided last night to quit. I emailed my resignation this morning. There was no doubt in his mind that it was the right call. He wanted to be here, to care for his beloved grandmother and run the bakery with her. Maybe he could find a way to tap into his experience as a sports nutritionist down the road. Come up with some all-natural baked energy bars or something. And you're just now telling me this? Don't you think I should have some say in this? I'm assuming you are planning on staying at my place, his grandmother asked. I thought you'd be happy, he said, surprised by her hostile tone. Not if it means throwing your life away. The other day you were all for me moving back to the Palmer Island permanently, he reminded her. That's when I thought you had more sense than to let Claire get away. What do you plan to do here? Work in the bakery all day? That's the plan. Miss Doris rose and put her arm around his tent shoulders. What your grandmother is trying to say is that she wants you to be happy. With Claire, we could all see a future for you here. Without her? Maybe you are better off without her. Unless. Unless what, his grandmother asked before he could get the words out. Unless he fights for love. I don't buy that Claire went back to the guy from New York. Truth be told, I don't think she'll move back up there either. We've all seen how happy she's been the past few weeks. You, young man, need to march over there and win her back. Miss Doris squeezed his shoulder before returning to her seat. She's right, you know. His grandmother smiled at him encouragingly. Maybe, but. But what, both women asked. I don't know how. Last night, it would have been easy to walk out and ask her to stay. Now that she'd possibly accepted Brent's proposal, he wasn't so sure. Oh, that's easy, his grandmother said. Miss Doris turned to look at him. Go talk to her. I'll stay here with your grandmother. I'll call you if we hear anything from the doctor. What do I say? Aiden grabbed his jacket and patted his pants pocket to make sure the keys to his truck were still there. Tell her how you feel. Lay it all out. Ask her to stay here on the island with you. His grandmother smiled at him encouragingly. Aiden hesitated. Sometimes we have to risk getting hurt. It's the price we all pay for a chance at love. And it's worth the risk every time. Miss Doris's eyes locked with his, and he got the feeling she spoke from experience. I'm not afraid of a little risk, he said. Being shut down wouldn't be pleasant, and the last thing he wanted was for Claire to tell him Brent was the one, but not knowing and wondering what could have been would be worse. That's my boy. Now go get the girl and then come back and get me out of here. I'm ready for my own bed and some real coffee. His grandmother motioned for Aiden to leave. He pulled his keys from his pocket and walked to the door. Oh, and Aiden? Miss Doris said. He turned around to look at the two of them. Flowers don't hurt either. The gift shop downstairs has some nice rose bouquets. Thanks. He nodded and pulled the door open. Wait. Come back here, his grandmother called after him, waving him to her bedside. Her tone was urgent. Are you feeling worse? he asked, rushing to her side. No. I want you to take this. She pulled the ring she'd worn every day for as long as he could remember from her finger and handed it to him. I can't take that. Yes, you can. I hope it will bring you and Claire as much love and happiness as your grandfather and I enjoyed. She put the diamond ring in his hand and closed his fingers around it. Chapter 26 Who could that be, her mother asked when the doorbell rang the next morning. It was Christmas Eve morning, and the two of them were the only ones awake. Her mother was busy rolling out dough to make cinnamon rolls. I'll get it, Claire said, grabbing her cardigan from the back of her chair. 
what are you doing here? Claire asked when she opened the door, surprised to see Aiden standing on her parents' porch. I need to talk to you. Do you have a minute? Aiden shuffled his feet, his hands shoved in his pockets. It was cold, but not freezing. Claire wondered if he was nervous about something. Of course. Everything okay with your grandmother, she asked, dread washing over her. She's fine. Miss Doris is with her. I'm hoping the doctors will let her come home today. That's not why I'm here. Why are you here, then? Is Brent around? Aiden asked. He pulled his hands from his pocket and rubbed them together. Of course not. Why would he be here? Claire was getting more, confused by the minute. I saw the two of you together in front of the hospital last night. I came down to give you a ride back to your car. His eyes were guarded. Ah, I see. Claire pulled the cardigan closer around herself to keep warm. Claire, don't make me drag everything out of you. Are the two of you back together? It looked like he proposed. Aiden took a step closer, his eyes intently watching her face. No, we're not. He showed up out of nowhere, and I told him we were done. I hope he gets the message this time. Good. Because there's something I need to get off my chest. Aiden took another step and raised his hand to cup her cheek. I'm crazy in love with you, Claire. I have been since middle school, and I don't think I ever stopped. Say that again. Claire was in a daze. This had to be a dream. I love you, Claire. I always have. The thought of you and that guy. It was driving me insane. He shook his head. Are you sure? Aiden nodded. I love you, too, she whispered. And she always had. Even when she moved to New York. When she started going out with Brent. It had never felt like this. Whole. Complete. Good. We can figure out everything else as we go along, Aiden said. He brushed his lips across hers, pulling her closer to deepen the kiss. Claire lost herself in the feeling of having him close. She didn't notice the cold temperatures or the wind. She didn't care that they were practically on display, standing on her parents' front porch. All that mattered was that Aiden loved her. I'm quitting my job in Atlanta and moving here permanently to care for my grandmother, Aiden said when they came up for air. She's going to need help for a while. Last night's events had made that clear. She does. That means I can't move to New York with you. At least not right now. Aiden walked to the rail, looking out over the front yard. She stepped up next to him and put her arm around his waist. Good. Because I'm not going back either. Well, I have to get my stuff, but I'm moving back here too. You don't have to do that. We can do the whole long distance thing for a while. He turned to look at her, his expression serious. I'm not moving back for you. I'm done with New York. Having you here too is a nice bonus though. She snuggled closer, pulling him against her. What about the editor position? It's your dream job. It was, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized I can do everything I really want to do from here. I enjoy working with authors, and I can do that as a freelancer. I have some feelers out in the writer community. Wouldn't be surprised if I had my first gig before the end of the year. Are you sure? Don't do this because of me. I'm not. Believe me, it's what I want. And it would give me a chance to get back to doing a little writing of my own. Who knows, one of these days, you might be dating a famous author. She smiled. The front door opened, and Claire's mother stuck her head out. Claire, the kids are up, and breakfast is almost ready. I could use your help in the kitchen. Give me a minute. I'll be right in. Claire wrapped her cardigan tighter around herself. She'd have to change into something a little warmer for the service. Aiden, would you like to join us? Her mother asked. I'd love to, but I'm heading back to the hospital. If everything goes well, my grandmother should be able to come home this morning, Aiden said. 
that's wonderful news. Please tell your grandmother we're all thinking of her and bring her over once she's feeling better. Claire's mother closed the door, giving the two of them a little privacy. There's something I want to do before I leave, Aiden said. What's that? Claire asked, holding her breath. She wouldn't mind another kiss like the one they shared the other night. The last thing she expected was to see Aiden get down on one knee. He took her hand in his. Marry me? Are you serious? Claire didn't know what to think. It was the second proposal she'd received in as many days. I am. If the past few days have taught me anything, it's that life and love are fleeting. We've lost so much time already. I'm not saying we have to get married right away, but I want to make it clear that I want to build a life with you. Here on the island. What do you say? Yes. I say yes. Claire's hand was shaking from the cold and the excitement as she watched Aiden slip the ring on her finger. It looked antique and vaguely familiar. It's my grandmother's. She insisted. Aiden rose and let go of her hand. It is beautiful. Claire examined the ring before throwing her arms around Aiden's neck and pulling him in for a kiss. You really like it, Aiden said with a huge grin on his face. My grandmother will be happy. Do you mind if we keep this to ourselves for a little while? Claire asked. Of course. I'm not sure I can keep this from my grandmother and Miss Doris for long, though. They are ready to ambush me as soon as I get back to the hospital. Let's wait until later tomorrow. Ada and Evan are so excited. I don't want to make Christmas morning about us. Claire turned around to see if either of her sister's kids was watching them from the window. Thankfully, she couldn't spot either of them or anyone else. It'll be our little secret, Aiden said before pulling her in for another kiss. Are you sure this is okay? Aiden asked when he and his grandmother followed Claire into the house. Of course. I wouldn't have asked you to come if it wasn't. Claire took his hand and pulled him down the hall and into the living room, where the rest of the Hammond family was gathered around a beautiful Christmas tree. Look what I got. Evan ran up, grinning widely and holding up a dump truck toy. That looks awesome, Evan. What are you going to carry with it? Aiden asked. I dunno. Evan looked confused, making Aiden regret his comment instantly. I think we have some rocks around here somewhere that you can fill this up with. Claire let go of his hand and dug in a drawer until she found what she was looking for. A small bag of decorative rocks. From the look of boxes and wrapping paper strewn across the floor, the children had finished unwrapping their presents already. Come on in, sit down. Can I get both of you some coffee? Mrs. Hammond asked. Decoff, if you have it, his grandmother said. Doctor's orders. Of course. I'll be right back. Mrs. Hammond walked into the kitchen. Aiden held out the tin of cookies he'd brought. We brought these. I wasn't sure if you wanted the kids to have them first thing in the morning. He opened the cookie tin he'd been carrying. Oh, please. They've been eating nothing but sugar for days. A few cookies won't hurt. Brooke smiled. Snowman cookies? Ava and Evan ran up and stuck their hands into the tin, each of them coming out with a cookie in each hand. I can't believe you got out of the hospital yesterday and baked cookies this morning. Claire looked at his grandmother. I didn't do the baking. Aiden did. They were cooled down and decorated when I got up this morning. She smiled proudly at her grandson. You could have fooled me, Claire said, picking up a snowman and biting off its head. Well, if I'm taking over the bakery, I'd better work on my skills, Aiden said, grinning as he watched the kids enjoy their cookies. Who said anything about you taking over? His grandmother asked. So you're staying on the island, Aiden? Mrs. Hammond asked. She walked back into the living room with a tray of cups and two thermal coffee carafes. That's the plan, Aiden said. Decoff, Mrs. Hammond said, handing his grandmother a cup of coffee and offering her sugar and cream. Not to be too forward, 
but I'm guessing having the two of you here on Christmas morning means you and my daughter are dating again? Mr. Hammond asked. We are. If that's okay with both of you. Aiden looked at Claire's parents. I'm a grown woman who can make her own decisions when it comes to her love life, Claire said. Aiden's eyes went to her hands. She was playing with the ring he'd given her yesterday. Oh my. You two are engaged. Brooke grabbed Claire's hand and looked at the engagement ring. You are? Claire's mother looked stunned. His grandmother smiled knowingly and sipped her coffee. We are, Claire confirmed. I'm sorry, sir. I should have asked for your permission first. Aiden rose and looked at Claire's father. No, my daughter is right. She's a grown woman, and I trust her judgment. Congratulations and welcome to the family. Mr. Hammond shook his hand. Thank you. Aiden went to sit next to Claire, putting her hand in his. Does that mean you're staying on Palmer too? Brooke asked her sister. It does. I'm moving back home for a bit and working on getting some freelance work as an editor. Claire smiled and squeezed his hand. He loved how happy she looked. What I want to know is when you'll get married and do I get to make the cake? His grandmother asked. Aiden felt both of Claire's parents' eyes on him. We're in no big hurry. It will take a while to rebuild our lives here. But yes, when we get married, I wouldn't have anyone else make my cake, Claire said. Wait until I tell Doris, his grandmother's eyes were twinkling. Aiden laughed. He felt happier than he'd ever been. It was a Christmas to remember. Epilogue Christmas Eve, one year later Are you ready, honey? Claire's father asked, holding out his arm. Claire took one last look in the mirror and nodded. You look beautiful, Brooke said. Her sister leaned forward and kissed her on the cheek before handing Claire her wedding bouquet. White baby's breath and various greens surrounded red roses and holly. You look like Mrs. Claus getting married, Ava said, her hands gripping the small basket of rose petals. Claire laughed. I'm going to take that as a compliment. It is. She's been watching a bunch of Christmas movies. The Santa Claus ones are her favorite, and she's not wrong. You make a stunning Christmas bride. Brooke tugged gently on the neckline of Claire's dress and moved the ruby necklace a fraction of an inch. Good. I was hoping I didn't suddenly look old and gray. Falling asleep had been a challenge, but Claire thought she'd done a good job covering her dark circles with concealer. You look beautiful, Aunt Claire. Aiden is going to pass out when he sees you. Ava's serious expression made Claire giggle. I hope not. But thank you, sweetie. Let's go find out. If he does, you might want to reconsider this whole marriage thing. Her father grinned, and it was obvious he wasn't serious. He loved Aiden. Her entire family did. They'd all spend time together at family gatherings and Sunday dinner. In a way, Aiden and his grandmother were part of the family already. Today would make it official. Let's. Claire took her father's arm, ready to walk down the aisle and marry the man she'd loved since middle school. A few last-minute stragglers entered the church ahead of them as they entered the main building of the church. The traditional wedding march started playing. Ava and Evan took their places in front of their mother. Here are the rings. It's very important that you don't drop it. Brooke handed Evan the small pillow. The golden wedding bands they'd chosen were tied on with a deep red ribbon. A piece of holy rounded out the decorations, keeping with the holiday theme of the wedding. I won't, mommy. The little boy wore a suit and bow tie. He held the pillow out in front of him, a concentrated look on his face. All right, then. Let's go. Remember, nice and slow. This isn't a race. Brooke lined the two of them up and took her position behind them. She turned and looked at Claire. Let's do this. Claire squeezed her father's arm and took the first step down the aisle. She took his breath away. 
Claire looked stunning walking on her father's arm toward him. A small part of his brain noticed that Ava and Evan were walking in front of her, followed by Brooke. His grandmother squeezed his hand. She'd scoffed at the idea of being his best man at first, but there was no one else he wanted by his side more. They'd grown closer than ever during the past year, working side by side. She's stunning, his grandmother said. Aiden nodded and swallowed hard. It was surprisingly hard to stand there and wait for the small group to make their way to the nave where he was waiting. Who gives this woman to be married today, the reverend asked. Her mother and I do. Claire's father's voice was loud and clear. Aiden stepped forward and held out his hand for his beautiful bride. Claire turned to hug her father before facing him, her eyes bright with excitement and anticipation. Ready? he asked softly. Claire nodded and took his hand. Standing before the reverend, their family, and friends behind them, the past year flashed in front of Aiden's eyes. So much had happened since the day he walked into Claire Hammond a few days before Christmas. His life was nothing like it had been 18 months ago when he'd worked long days in Atlanta. And he wouldn't have it any other way. We're here today to join Aiden and Claire in the union of marriage. This is not a step taken lightly. I have had the pleasure of watching Claire and Aiden's relationship grow and strengthen over this past year. They support one another. They make the other one a better person. And I have no doubt that they will take on the responsibility of this marriage with great care and the attention it deserves. I can't think of two lovelier people to join this Christmas Eve. Here, here, someone yelled, followed by a round of laughter and murmurs of approval. The reverend raised his hands, calling his congregation to order. Aiden bit his lip, holding back a laugh. Claire was grinning widely. It didn't help. At this rate, he'd chew through his cheek before this wedding was over. The man turned his gaze at the two of them, and everything and everyone else faded into the background. Aiden, do you take Claire to be your wife? To have and to hold, from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, excluding all others, for as long as you shall live? Aiden cleared his throat. I do. Claire, do you take Aiden to be your husband? To have and to hold, from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, excluding all others, for as long as you shall live? Aiden looked at his bride. Claire took a deep breath, looked deep into his eyes, and then he heard the two words he'd been waiting for with bated breath. I do. By the power vested in me by God and by the state of South Carolina, I pronounce you husband and wife. Aiden didn't wait for the reverend to tell him he could kiss his bride. He closed the distance between them in one step, cupped her face with both hands, and kissed her until they were both gasping for air. She was his. He was hers. And this would be another Christmas to remember. The End this has been Coming Home for Christmas. Written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2023 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.